Welcome to Sacred Realms. Huh? It's a great day in Hyrule, y'all. Welcome to Sacred Realms, a Zelda retrospective podcast. I'm your host, Lyndon Willoughby, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Matt Willoughby. After a uh, after a week-long hiatus uh, due to some unfortunate family circumstances on our end of things, we are back recording pod, and it feels good to be back, Matt. It always feels good to be back recording pod. I think, um, you know, we... We shared on our socials, so I guess we might as well say it say it here as well. Our our grandmother passed away unexpected unexpectedly last week, um, so we we took some time to uh, be with family and kind of go through those roller coaster of emotions without putting it on you, the fair listener, to do that with us. So um, it's been a it's been a tough week, and I think you and I are both very excited to be back to the safe, happy, warm blanket that is pod. Um, I think yeah. you and I can both say that this is a really happy, creative, free flowing, good energy space for us. And, um, it's healing in its own way to be back and, uh, talking to all of these wonderful folks. Yep. Much like taking a red potion straight to the dome. This is, uh, <laughs> this is good vibes only healing energy for us. And, uh, we're very happy to be back here doing it. Um, Honestly, and, and I mean, if for no other reason, because it's always fun doing a wrap up episode on a game, right? Like not actually yeah. the rank and recap, which is next week, but actually discussing the end of a game. Um, that's always a good time. Uh, I, I can't think of a time that we've ever not, you know, spun out and had some really good chats and conversations. Uh, you know, once the actual like end game of uh, of an experience comes into focus and we know like what everything's been building towards and we know how it all ends up and the final result of everything. Um, that's always a really good time. And I think that today is going to be no exception as far as that is concerned um, to join us in this discussion. We have brought back one of our favorite returning co-hosts, uh, somebody who we have not caught up with on this game since much earlier in our time with it. Um, it was a much darker time then, Matt. You know, um, it was a it, universally it, dark time in, ter <laughs> in, in terms of in terms of like gameplay and whatnot. Uh, look, it was things were dire, and we were approaching things from a very negative perspective. Um, that was not healing pod. It, that was not. That, that was, was a rupor, no, not a rupee. That was a rupor. And uh, but you know what? We've dug up a few rupees since then. I think is fair to say. I I would agree. I don't know if they're the gold rupees, but they they've been at least giant red rupees. I would say. They've been good. Are we coming out in the negative? I don't know. You'll Maybe have to tune we'll in next week to find out. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. I was going to say, you break even, you feel pretty good about it. Uh, anyway, uh, here to talk about all of these things with us tonight is returning co-host, uh, favorite guest of the pod, Mr. Max Nichols himself. How you doing, Max? I'm doing great. It's good to be back. It's been a long time. Uh I, guess, I think it was the second episode, maybe, that I was here last. Uh, and I have played a lot of Phantom Hourglass myself since then. Uh, yeah, uh, it was it was early July, and you and I recorded that episode together. So um, definitely like in I real world time. I was definitely there for that one, too. Well, I, but in person, Matt. In oh, person. that's right. Y'all were in person. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's that one. I hate to, I hate to break Matt, it to Matt you. Matt thinking he's being snubbed over here. Yeah. Look, nobody's forgetting about you, Matt. You just weren't in the room. I think I've missed two total episodes of this podcast. Like, I think. Maybe three. But I just didn't want that to be over in, in an overinflated number. No, nobody's... Yeah, okay. No, okay. One, no one's here, okay. like, subtracting numbers from your total unfairly. Okay. All right, all right. Fair enough, fair okay. enough, fair enough. 
<laughs> feel a little defensive over there. Uh, well, we, I we mean, went back and we uh, overwrote your voice with mine in all of the <laughs> <laughs> whatever technology they use to like fake Mark Hamill's voice in The Mandalorian. We use that on Max, and that's just all your dialogue now is like <laughs> is like AI Max voice. Well, that um, would be more enjoyable for most folks. So I that's don't, fair. I don't think that that's true, and also it would uh, it would further welcome the inevitable demise of our society uh, by granting more power to our <laughs> mechanical overlords so um always say please and thank you to your uh, virtual assistants no, like yeah, that's siri very and alexa important. that's very important. always say please and thank you they <laughs> will rise up and they will murder you so yes yeah, just say please and thank you. siri's always listening um max very glad to have you back and yeah like you said it's been a it's been a big um span of time uh, between appearances for you i know that we originally had you slated for an earlier episode in the season and then you suggested that it might actually be a good thing uh, to space things out just a little bit more, especially given that I think you were in a very similar place to us in terms of sentiment towards this game when we recorded that yeah. first episode. So we wanted to give everybody some time to let things distill a bit. I was, yeah, I was signed up for the ghost ship episode, but, and I, and I did, that is kind of a high point of the game for me. Um, so I'm slightly sad I missed it, but I think this is better. Uh, I come more full circle now and I can actually share full thoughts having completed it now, which I wouldn't have been able to do prior. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I do want to say too, that it's going to be, it's going to be not too very long before we hear from you again. Uh, because of course we've got you on this episode next week, we're going to be welcoming the detective back to do the rank and recap as per usual. Uh, but we are going to be finishing this season of pod up with an epilogue episode as we do at times. Um, it's going to be somewhat of a more, uh, bonus conversation. And the topic of that episode, uh, you suggested to Matt and I, and I think we both felt like it was just, uh, just a really, really great idea. Um, we're going to be having a bonus episode, uh, discussing what we would change about the Temple of the Ocean King if we had the power to do so. Uh, and I think as a prompt, that is just a fantastic sounding uh, discussion. Yeah, I uh, I think I pitched it as redesigning the Temple of the Ocean King to Matt and Lyndon's taste. Uh, I think there's like a kernel of something cool in there and they just well, spoiling the podcast a little bit here, I guess, but I think they missed the mark in some ways. With the Temple of the Ocean King. I'm not sure that uh, anybody has picked up on our true <laughs> thoughts towards the Temple of the Ocean King over the last eight episodes of this podcast. I think we've been, uh, this is me being sarcastic, we've been very, um, very straightforward with our, our disdain for that whole experience. But, uh, and I, so I thought it would be fun to run it as a, uh, in a way that's inspired by a formal brain cast, uh, not brain cast. Wow. Um, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? Brainstorm. Brainstorm. Brainstorming hey, session. Yeah. Brainstorm. Brainstorming <laughs> session. <laughs> the way it might be run in a game company. Um, uh, so that'll be fun when we get to it. You must be a professional amateur podcaster now because you're you're framing everything mentally in terms of a cast. <laughs> Everything is content. Everything is truly content. But this sounds like it will be really fun content. Um, I hope during the course of that episode that we're going to get your personal thoughts on what would make for a better experience as well. Oh, yes. I will. I will not be able to hold back. I'll be involved, too. Gotcha. We it, we would be disappointed if that weren't the case. Um For now, though, what I really would like to do is to catch up with you a little bit on how your uh, thoughts and feelings towards Phantom Hourglass have kind of evolved in the episodes and chunks of game prior to the end that we're going to be discussing in the Sacred Realms rundown today. Because I think that Matt and I have, like, we've obviously been on a gradually improving um, uh, level of sentiment with Phantom Hourglass over the past few weeks. I think especially, uh, so from from post the ghost ship until the end pretty much it's been sort of a story of increasing gains and better experiences and um you know just us kind of falling into a place where we're finding more things to enjoy and i'm curious to know if that's been the case for you as well yeah uh so when when we last spoke um, I I was in a similar place as you two, where I was like really, really not liking the touchscreen controls. Um, 
and that is still true. Still don't like him, but I did I did get over the hump of being bad at them and disliking them. Now I merely dislike them. So I they eventually kind of faded into this background thing that you know, I could tell that it was resulting in combat that I enjoyed less than I would have in other Zelda games. Um, but it wasn't an active annoyance anymore once I, you know, became competent enough to, to use them. Um, and then that that further that you know that sentiment further got a little better as I acquired really awesome items that could only work in the touchscreen controls. Um, you know, almost almost fun enough to make up for the touchscreen controls in the first place. Right, it was almost yeah. worth it. Uh, so I came around somewhat on that topic. Um, and I also came around somewhat on the my other big complaint, which was uh, the dungeon theming. I, uh, I really felt like most of the dungeons in this game were uh, forgettable to kind of a, a really negative extent. Um, like, I feel like the dungeons in Link's Awakening and Link to the Past are more memorable than almost any of the dungeons in this game. Um which is kind of embarrassing for a game released in 2007, uh, if you ask me. But uh, <laughs> later in the game, that I, I also got happier with the dungeons. The last couple dungeons I thought were actually pretty pretty good on that front. That's really and they were always good on the puzzle front, of course. Okay, yeah, okay, cool. And that's what I was curious about, because I think one of the things that we've consistently said throughout the entire game is that we felt that from at least a difficulty and length standpoint, um, difficulty, of course, in terms of mostly puzzle solving and like critical thinking skills, not necessarily combat, but um, we felt like the dungeons were hitting uh, pretty well from those from that perspective um basically for the entire stretch of the game and i'm curious to know when you say a dungeon is forgettable to you is that more of like an atmosphere and an, an environment thing because i know you know we've definitely kind of been in agreement that like for as fun as these dungeons can be and as much as we appreciated that they are not brief i mean they're pretty you know substantial feeling dungeons at times um they do tend to lack distinctive identities as spaces. Yeah. Um, that You're pretty much correct on that. Uh, I, I think that I value dungeon theming, kind of the aesthetics and the emotional tone of it, um, maybe more highly than you two do. Because I, if I were to rank Zelda games based on how much I like their dungeons, this would be maybe be the very bottom of the list. Wow. Um, of the whole series, barring maybe Zelda 2. Uh, topical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we haven't had any discussions even remotely like that <laughs> at all in this season of the show. And and it, so it's kind of harsh sounding for me to say that probably because these dungeons are competent, right? They're like, they've got, pretty good puzzles. They tend to have good items. Um, they have good bosses mostly, but they just do not come together for me. Uh, and I think like taking a step back and trying to analyze, like, what do I like about dungeons? Um, I think a lot of it boils down to like these three, three kind of pillars of dungeons, right? One of them is sense of place. One of them is, you know, there is combat and, and other moment to moment kind of gameplay fun where like you do actions and there's something that's fun about doing those actions within the gameplay of, of dungeon, um, which is mostly combat. Uh, but it, it can also be fun item usage. Um, and then the third one would be like, do I think there are good puzzles? But more importantly, do I think there are puzzles that feel like they create a cohesive like experience together from beginning to end um so you know you have like in your a b a l b w season you would talk about how they felt like two-thirds of a dungeon um like they would they would teach you mechanic and then they'd have they'd have you do it with slightly harder puzzles and then they'd end before they got to the you know the third tier of like the most ambitious version of those puzzles right um, like that would be an example of a co coherent experience from beginning to end with the puzzles. 
Um, and to me, the top of that top, like the best version of that is, is it's kind of the, the puzzle box dungeons, the ones where there are puzzle mechanics that require you to think of the dungeon conceptually as a complete space altogether. Stuff like the, the water level in the water temple, um, stone Things tower temple. puzzle isn't yeah the puzzle isn't just in front of you it's not just the room you're in it's something that is broader within the context of the dungeon yeah so i mean on those three three legs you could say <laughs> of this stool uh that is the zelda dungeon um i just really felt like they completely failed on the uh the aesthetic side of things the, the yeah. emotional tone, the theming, the music, like feeling like it's a it's a place that's going to stick in your head. Um, I just I, even the best dungeons in this game barely appear on that chart of like doing good on that front. Um, and the first like four or five of them basically just fail. But would you say, so like, I was interested to hear your thoughts specifically on the ice temple, which we loved for the sole reason of the puzzles interacted so spectacularly with a truly phenomenal item. So like you have a great item that is utilizing an otherwise horrible control scheme to create really cool and unique and good puzzles. Like, how do you feel yeah. about that? And, like, I think that one had well, more personality. Yeah, I was going to say, and it had the environment. Yeah, right? it had more personality than any of the other dungeons. And I totally agree with you that all the dungeons pretty much feel bland. But, like, Ice Temple specifically, and to a lesser extent, mm-hmm. whatever the, the... Muto. Muto, Temple of Muto. Like, those two, which we really loved. Like, wh- what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, those are definitely the standout dungeons of this game for me, is uh, Muto, Ice Temple, and Ghost Ship. And I know you two didn't like the Ghost Ship that much. Um, the Ghost Ship, to me, was like firing at 70% on all three of those categories. And I'd rather have a dungeon that's like, you know, kind of mediocre at all three than like really good at two and really bad at the third. Um mm, Okay. Yeah, I think but, for uh, us yeah. it was. I think for us it was just it was uh, escort mission the dungeon, and, well, and uh, it, it felt ugh. a lot like the Temple of the Ocean King. But to your point, Max, I mean, and I never really thought about this as a as a factoid until just now. But uh, this game does not have anything approaching the puzzle box convention of dungeon design at all. Like it, it, it never really touches on that in any major way. Um, and of course, going back to the definition of a puzzle box dungeon as being something where the like the the state of the dungeon is changing as you progress through it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the closest they really get is the occasional red and blue block puzzles. Uh, I'm trying to think: is there like a room where you ra- like raise or lower the water in one of them? In the Temple of Muto, you do raise and lower the water a yeah. couple of times. So it's they get nothing- a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to me, to me, the dungeons of this game mostly feel like they're self-contained puzzles. Like you go into a room, this room has a puzzle. You complete the puzzle to go to the next room, um, which is a a hallmark of non Zelda dungeon design. Like that's something I expect when I play some other company's Zelda clone, um, not from Nintendo. Hmm. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's fair. That's fair. And, and you know, one of the things that you mentioned as well, like you, you mentioned music as one of the big things too. And, w- you know, we've kind of dogged on the the musical element of this game quite a lot throughout this entire season. Um, and it's one of those things where I think back to even Link's Awakening made in 1993, which had bespoke musical tracks for each dungeon, right? I mean, yep. uh, so it, it is kind of bizarre that so many steps are, taken backwards in certain ways i mean you know and that's not to say that Link's awakenings dungeons are like the pinnacle of top-down dungeon design like i think a lot of them are really good but there is a criticism there that it's just kind of like a, a key fest over and over and over right but um but still i i don't think you could look at Link's awakenings suite of dungeons and say that they don't have um 
atmosphere and and tone, right? And especially in the remaster when they have the ability to kind of portray that just a little bit more successfully. Um, yeah, like it's definitely something that's happening there. Um, and I agree with you that it's an area in which Phantom Hourglass has dropped the ball just a little bit. I am curious. This is a, a question just a bit aside from Phantom Hourglass specifically, but we've got a few minutes to talk here uh, while Matt finishes up the plot recap. So I'm just going to just going to drop it on you. What would you say is the most successful puzzle box dungeon in the history of the Zelda series to you? <laughs> oh boy. Um, that's, that's a good one. Let's see. Try to think what I put in that. I mean, in Ocarina of Time, it's probably the water temple and yep. the water temple has its issues, but it is also so memorable and such like that's the example i always use for this right because everyone everyone immediately is like oh that's what you mean uh i mean majora's mask it would be stone tower temple um but all the dungeons in stone tower in majora's mask are strong puzzle box dungeons um to a lesser extent woodfall but the other three for sure yeah Uh, (laughs) and um twilight princess and skyward sword are both pretty good on this front trying to remember it's been a long time since I played Twilight Princess. Yeah, I would say uh, e- even Great Bay Temple in Majora's Mask. I mean, uh, that's a that's a dungeon that people don't talk about a lot. But even like unlocking new, um, like uh, unlocking new valves or whatever to change the current of the water as it goes through the temple, like that kind of qualifies. Yeah. Um. I mean, I have a big soft spot for Eagle's Tower and Link's Awakening, but I don't think I can. <laughs> don't we all <laughs> nominate that for this? <laughs> um, I don't think it's the best. But hey, uh, sorry, but Link's Awakening. You you could say though, you could make an argument for that being the first true puzzle box dungeon in the history of the Zelda series, though. Yeah, that might be true. I'm trying to think. Did Link's Link to the Past do much? Was there? Uh, I can't think Not of a lot anything yeah like that yeah um I I'm going to say the water temple but I don't I don't feel strongly that that is necessarily the best one that's just the best one I can think of right now <laughs> It's a good answer um, I mean and, yeah. and and also uh, gets points for being maybe like a hugely controversial answer for some people who who still yeah. have like the that unfair like the the meme quality of the water temple and that's kind of what they keep in their minds right <laughs> um, Matt was asking about like kind of specifically my thoughts on the the ice temple uh, and the the grappling hook in this game Phantom Hourglass and uh, I kind of shared a lot of the same thoughts as you two like. I got that item. I'm like, whatever. It's a grappling hook. I don't care. Uh, and then it like, they kept surprising me with interesting and innovative ways of, of making me use it. Um, and like they, they did that multiple times. Like every time I thought I understood the extent of the mechanics related to this item, uh, I would find a new use for it. Um, you know, it's like, okay, you can, you can use it as a hook shot. That's version one. You can use it as a tight rope. Okay. That's cool. Uh, you can use it to throw yourself. Oh, you can use it to throw yourself up a level. Oh, you can use it to reflect projectiles. Um, and it just kept going. Uh, and so like, I was very impressed by that and I enjoyed using it a lot. And I think it kind of single-handedly almost makes the the ice temple a big success in this game. Uh, So, so you said earlier that the, way that a lot of these items are used and the way that they leverage the stylus controls specifically are almost enough to make you forget about how bad the stylus controls are for things like movement and combat. And I'm curious, how close is it to making that just a complete wash for you? Because to me, um, I've been back and forth about that. And I think one of the biggest points in favor of like it just being a complete even out is the fact that combat, like sword combat, never gets more complicated than it does the first time that you fight one of those uh, Zora warriors with a shield. Like the game yeah. never, the game never really develops sword stylus combat 
in any major way. Like it, it is always what it is. It's um, like at its most complicated, it is just using an item to stun an enemy and then you go in for just your regular swipes or jump attacks or whatever. Yeah. I, I think kind of at a high level, I I fall in favor of being like, this was a cool experiment. I'm glad they did this and I'm glad they're not doing it anymore is kind of where my my head goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is easy to say now, many years later, now that I have many other Zelda games that don't do that, that I've enjoyed since then. At the time, oh boy, was I mad about the touchscreen controls. Um, I th- One of the things that happens to the touchscreen controls that is really just a forever knock against them for me, like it's hard to overcome this, is the fact that they... Um, one, I feel like they really disconnect my feeling of inhabiting my avatar. Uh, right? Because when when you're playing a game, you get into this headspace where you kind of stop seeing the controller. You stop thinking about like, oh, I'm pressing a button to make that those pixels on screen do this. You just like, I swung my sword. Or I ran over there. Like, that's the sort of way you start thinking about your avatar. Yeah. Um, and the touchscreen controls feel like it's just always a barrier between me and that feeling. Um, because it feels indirect, uh, and and a big part of that is the fact that they're very slow paced way of controlling the character, um, in, and it doesn't allow you to parallel do things in parallel very easily. You can't do the thing where you, you know, you're moving to the left and throwing your boomerang north t- top right, and you know, kind of dodging a attack from a like an arrow that was shot by a guard. Like you just, you can't do all these things at the same time. Like you would in a link to the past or links awakening. Um, and, and it even apply, it even extends to the items. Like the items in this game tend to be really cool. They're really, they're imaginative. They're a new way of interacting with the world that you don't get in other Zelda games, but you have to stop moving and click on the button and go into item mode and then, click around to use the item and like you can kind of make it faster with the the shoulder button. Um, but it's still very like stop and go gameplay wise. You're never fluidly switching between sword attacks and item usage and movement. And yeah, and there, that's a hallmark of top down Zelda games. There is a buffer at all times in this game of think to execute, right? Where, you want to do something and then you have to think this is the action to perform and then you have to intentionally do that. And it, it never like, there's always like that extra few split seconds of effort required to execute on whatever you want to do. Um, and that does slow things down a lot. And I, I do think you're right. It really pulls you out of feeling as integrated to the character that you're seeing on your screen as you do in a lot of other games. Yeah. And, and people, different players are affected by that to different extents. Like some people that doesn't harm it at all. Like it doesn't, doesn't get in the way at all. I think that might, might describe Josh, for instance, and not, not positive, but I know Josh plays a lot of like strategy games and tactics games. And like, I don't think he's as in need of being immersed in his avatar as like I am. Um, Sorry if I'm just putting words in your mouth, Josh. I'm not sure if that's actually true. But, <laughs> uh, like just as an example, there there are different types of players out there where this isn't a barrier. Um, well, if Josh feels incredibly slighted by that remark, then I'm sure we'll all hear about it in the Discord here in the next <laughs> week. Uh, but I feel and, like uh, based on the things he said recording with us, I, I feel like you're probably pretty close to right on that. Yeah. I, I also think it's um, I also want to talk about the fairy hammer or whatever it's called. Oh yeah, go for yeah, it. The one that allows fairies to viciously murder their their <laughs> foes. Uh, <laughs> I love that's my favorite weapon of the game. That's my favorite more than the grapple hook um, because it feels really good to use. Uh, it felt like just this huge power up where suddenly I'm not. I can do. It essentially feels like you can do sword swings that are disconnected from your avatar. Um, which is a really good fit and feels really good on this touchscreen setup. Um, and it felt appropriate for kind of near the end game because it felt like a huge power-up. Uh, 
it still the, has the problem I talked about where you can't you can't move and use it at the same time. Sure. Unless you're on a moving platform. The thing that I will say, <laughs> right, right. The thing I will say, I, so a few weeks ago, whenever we got the hammer, um, I was kind of struggling to articulate why I was enjoying it so much. And I was thinking about it last week and I realized it was because it was connecting back to like a very, very, very early gaming memory that I enjoyed which is the feeling of getting the power up hammer in the um oh gosh what is this game even called it's the uh uh it's the original donkey kong where you're mario and you're mm. in the side scrolling levels and donkey kong's like throwing barrels at you right but like you can get yep. the you can get the power up hammer and then you're just like going to town on everything and obviously it doesn't work exactly like that but there was something about it that just kind of like tickled those like memory neurons in the back of my brain in that's fun in a pleasant way. Uh, and I enjoyed that yeah. about it. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was Miyamoto's first game. Uh, it was almost a Popeye game. Did you know that Nintendo no. tried to get the Popeye license for that and they couldn't get it. So they made Donkey Kong instead. Wow. What would the world be like if we had had Popeye versus Donkey Kong instead of <laughs> Mario? <laughs> Um, it's uh, just like how the Zelda theme was almost the, uh, oh, the Bolero or whatever. The, yeah. Ravel's Bolero. Um, and they found out like the copyright wasn't expiring until a month after they were going to ship it. So they had to make the Zelda theme instead. Look, sometimes <laughs> things just work out, you know? <laughs> yep. Uh, but yeah, hammer, hammer. Good. Smashing things good. It, it makes it play like an like a FPS almost, right? It's just point and click and shoot and hit the thing that you pointed at. Uh, except it's your fairy swinging a hammer ten times her size at something's head. In uh, ten years, uh, whenever Max has worked on an FPS game in which he's created a, uh, a hammer item, you can all <laughs> come back to this episode and be like, "That's where it started. That was the genesis." <laughs> Of that crazy hammer. Um, yeah, let's see. Trying to think of other thoughts I might have related to those. Uh, we could talk about the the world design a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, go for it. I mean, we we unlocked a full other half of the Great Sea, or at least what we thought was the Great Sea, um, in uh, in the time since you've been on this podcast last. So, yeah, feel free to yeah. talk about any of that. Um, so this is kind of the other like so the the big knocks I had to have against this game overall generally are touchscreen controls, dungeon aesthetics, um, and world design. And we talked about this a little bit in my last episode, and honestly, my thoughts haven't really changed very much which is that I feel like they got the sense of scale pretty weird and wrong in this game. Um, it always feels like the world is very small and your camera is really close in. Uh, and I don't really get feelings of like discovery in this world. Uh, I feel like I'm kind of charting, you know, my route on a highway map or something. Like it's like put in the boat GPS and play a little uh, Star Fox mini game. You know, for a little while, and then you're there. Uh, Star Fox, Star Fox, that. we have at home, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and that's basically what I said before, and I still pretty much stand by it. The one place in the game where at that I kind of soften that opinion is is in the the top right quadrant. The um, the Cobble Kingdom. Yeah, I mean the the that Cobble would, Kingdom area. That would be the Northeast Great Sea. Yes, thank you. Uh, and yeah, I like I that area got me feeling a little exploratory and a little adventurous. You know, in the way that I want to feel from a Zelda game. Um, and I think it's because it felt more like I was delving into the unknown, and I was I didn't know what to expect and. Most of that still wasn't in the actual overworld. But, you know, when you get to those islands, they're rather large and there's a sense of not knowing what you're going to find around the corner or what this switch is going to do within those islands, which is the sort of exploratory feeling I want. Um, they don't they don't get the grand exploration feeling that 
certain Zelda games achieve where you're exploring in a large overworld, but that's okay. I don't, I don't need that in every game. A little intimate exploration is fine too. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it really does kind of contribute to this sense of the world feeling a little static, right? It, it just doesn't feel quite yeah. as alive as maybe um, I would have liked for it to. And, you know, some some folks in the Discord a few weeks back when we said that we were finding the Great Sea exploration to be uh, substantially less fun in this game versus what you do in Wind Waker, a lot of people kind of were coming in and saying like, well, I mean, that's interesting because you're kind of doing more, right? Like you're having to, like you're, you're drawing a path for your boat and then while you're sailing, you're doing things and... You know, it does in some ways feel a little bit more interactive Um, and uh, like especially, you know, some people pointed out that our perspective on this whole issue was kind of colored a little bit by the fact that we had been playing Wind Waker HD in which you have the swift sail and you don't have to change the wind direction at all times. Right. Um, Which is fair. (laughs) Um, Yeah. which, Which is definitely fair. But I yeah, I do still think that. The Great Sea in the Wind Waker just does tend to feel a little bit more uh, natural and just a, a bit more lively than anything that yeah. this game manages to accomplish. I I totally agree, um, and I was I was shocked when I saw a couple voices. I think primarily Joshua's um, saying Josh that, like, does love this it, game. <laughs> yeah, to, <laughs> uh, to them, like the overworld was the same as the Wind Waker. To Josh, he said, he, I think he literally said, like, it's the same experience to him. Um, again, I'm putting words in Josh's mouth. Sorry, Josh. Uh, but I, that's that's more or less paraphrased what I remember him saying. And, and like when I read that from him, I think he said this in the Discord. Maybe it was on one of the podcast episodes. I was, I like, was like shocked. I was like, what? How is this possible? How could someone feel like these are the same experiences? Because to me, they're <laughs> night and day. Uh, Impossible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I ended up writing this big like freaking essay in the pot in the Discord about like why I think they're different. Uh, but I basically I, I like outlined these three things. Um, and the uh, I guess I'm just going to talk about them. Who's going to stop me? Right? Yeah, go uh, for it. That's why the we had you I mentioned on. Was. <laughs> was uh, the, the basically I came up with these three concepts that I think distinguish different types of Zelda overworlds. Um, and the first one was abstraction. Uh, right. And, you know, abstraction is uh, the, the process of taking something that potentially has a lot of complexity or detail and, and representing it in a way that has less complexity and less detail. Um, so, you know, with, with imagery, High, high, a very non abstract image would be a photo, and a very abstract image would be a stick figure, right? Um, so to me, like world maps in a lot of games have varying levels of abstraction. In like Ocarina of Time or The Wind Waker, there's like compared to the normal gameplay, the overworlds have no abstraction, it's the same degree of detail of character and models, and like it's the same art, and you're doing the same things, it's not abstracted at all. Um, and then compared to like Zelda two, it's very abstracted, right? You, you have, you're small, you're a different art. You don't have the same gameplay. Um, and like the actual representation of the world is very like map, like it's very iconic, like a, a, it's not to scale. Um, so that's a very abstracted overworld. Uh, the other one I mentioned was sandbox expressiveness, It probably needs a catchier name, but (laughs) uh, sandbox expressiveness is this idea of like, how much can you express your intention and yourself through your actions in a game? You know, a game like Tony Hawk has very high levels of expressiveness. And so does a game like Super Mario 64. They're both games are like, you can make your character move in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of actions available to you. Stuff like your momentum will change the way you jump. Um, pulling back on the control stick in another direction will make you do a backflip. Like all this stuff where like you can kind of fluidly express what you're trying to do quickly and easily with the controls and your character will, will um, reflect that. Uh, and a game like 
again, most Zelda games, the sandbox expressiveness is the same on the overworld as it is anywhere else, right? You're, you have the same actions available to you in Hyrule Field as you do in the Shadow Temple or Kakariko Village in Ocarina of Time. Um, and a game like Zelda 2 has very low sandbox expressiveness because you can't really do anything. You can't press any buttons to make your character do anything there other than like interact with a boulder sometimes. Um, and to me, Phantom Hourglass compared to the Wind Waker has much less expressiveness, right? I'm kind of just watching this boat move and I'm clicking on the screen to fire cannonballs. That's all I can do in the overworld of Phantom Hourglass. Whereas in the Wind Waker, I can hold right and I can hold right at different angles to change my boat uh, at different you know, degrees of control and um, well, I can you, jump. you, yeah, I was gonna say you could even pop your bow out while you're on the boat and go into the same kind of experience with your bow and arrow on the boat as you would do when you're, you know, not in it, you know, when you're in a dungeon or on land or whatever. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And, and the third one I came up with, was, oh, by the way, the sandbox expressiveness is important because it can, makes you connect more with your character. This is the exact same thing that I was talking about with the touchscreen controls, where it's harder to translate fluidly your intention into the avatar. It doesn't feel um, like like w- with the touch controls. I think what I'm I'm just going to say what you've been saying in maybe a different way. It doesn't feel like I'm the one doing the thing. It is right. It is it is something that is being expressed outside of myself like i'm it's like i'm entering command like a command sequence into a computer that's going to go execute a task instead of executing that task myself to think of it in like coding terms where you like execute a string of commands and then the computer just goes and does instead of just actually getting in there and doing it yourself i don't know if that makes any sense or it's more confusing but that's kind of how i think about it it, it totally makes sense. You're giving an order to your avatar instead of being your avatar. Yep. Uh, the third thing I pointed out uh, for overworld stuff is uh, modal gameplay. But this one's pretty simple. Like, is it a different gameplay mode on the overworld than it is when you're not in the overworld? Um, for most Zelda games, the answer is no. But for, again, Adventure of Link... The answer is definitely yes. Totally different controls, different viewpoint, different everything. Uh, and it's also yes for Phantom Hourglass, where it's different different camera, different controls, different actions available to you. Um, the world looks different. Uh, so it, it, does, it does have the modal gameplay, whereas the Wind Waker has much less modal gameplay. Like you do still enter like sailing mode when you press A to pull out your shield, your, your sail. But it's not a clear cut. It's not like a loading screen and now you're in a new mode. It's like you're fluidly going back and forth between them. Yeah, because you could, I mean, you could sail your boat up to Windfall Island and then hop out of it and swim to shore. Or you could just sail your boat around the other side of the island and do the same thing there, right? I mean, there's there's no barriers between your boat and the island, Pretty much. Right. Um, there, there's no hard break between those experiences, which I, th- I think is a big deal. I also want to say that I don't think I can think of a much better incentive to point people towards our Discord than the fact that once you're in there, you get essays from Max Nichols on L- some literal essays sometimes. It's yeah. great. They're always some fun might to read. call them rants, but uh, they're fun either way. With a capital R. Yeah, go to our Discord and get some of Max's capital R rants. They're a good time. Um, we're, we're a solid 45 minutes into this episode right now, so I'm going to like, oh, no. I'm going to grab the steering wheel and I'm going to like, I'm, I'm going to take the stylus and draw the boat of this episode <laughs> off in another direction and get us on track to talk about what we actually played this week. Um, but this is all been really great max like i I think this is all awesome color um on kind of yours and our final thoughts on the game going into this section because the reality is that nothing nothing is changing in this section of the game um and honestly it's it's kind of limited in scope just in terms of like where you go and what you do so this all feels like good preamble um yeah i think the dungeon section and the like the 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 sacred realms rundown is probably going to be a little shorter than most 
end chapters of Sacred Earl's yeah. Rundown. Like, yeah, I, I think that that's right. It's very abbreviated ending. Yeah. Which feels weird. But we'll talk about all of that more here in just a second. Let's go ahead and get the housekeeping out of the way, and then we'll dive into that conversation. If you didn't know, Sacred Realms is a weekly re-examination of The Legend of Zelda one little slice at a time. Sacred Realms drops every Wednesday and is available on all major podcast networks. Every week we play a new section of a Zelda game. Then we sit down here to talk and to drop our hot takes. If that sounds fun to you, please head over to Apple Podcasts, hit that subscribe button. Be sure to leave us a review. Five-star reviews are greatly appreciated, and they have a chance to get a shout-out here on the show. <laughs> if you want more Sacred Realms in your life, you can head over to patreon.com slash sacredrealmspod to get access to our Discord channel, listener mail, vote on what game we play next, and much more. Uh, one of those benefits that I just mentioned, vote on what game we play next, is in full swing as of this moment. Uh, the poll for what we play in Season 10 of this game is currently live. Uh, people are voting between Phantom Hourglass. No, gosh. Wow, Phantom you're Hourglass. really having a hard time I've tonight. Got, I've got Phantom Hourglass on the mind. People are voting between Twilight Princess and Majora's Mask and what looked to be a runaway victory for Twilight Princess in the early days of this poll has now evened out into a straight tie. Not anymore. It's no I just longer looked straight. at it. It's no longer a, like... I just looked okay. At it. I looked at it earlier today, and it was not a straight tie. This I, is literally changing like by the hour. I looked at it two seconds ago. You're Hold right. On. I'm looking at it now. What is it's it at? Right. Forty nine. Forty nine. Okay. <laughs> An absolute draw between Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess, uh, which I don't think any of us saw coming. It really looked like mm -hmm. Twilight Princess had this in the bag. Um, but how many days do we have left in the poll, Matt? Uh, four days left. So at the time this recording releases, it'll be like two. Okay, so if you hear this episode on Wednesday and you feel very strongly that you want to hear one of these games versus the other, just a reminder that patrons of any level on our Patreon are able to vote in that poll. And at this moment, every vote truly counts. Yep. And also patrons of any level get access to our Discord. So $3 yes, a month. they do. $3 a month, you can vote on the game, make your voice heard, possibly be that swing vote, and uh, also listen to Max's Capital R Rants. <laughs> Which all of those things sound great in my I personal say, opinion. I will say I bought myself a Steam Deck two weeks ago, uh, anticipating the victory of Twilight Princess and deciding for myself that having bought that game three times on several different platforms, that I was going to be totally comfortable maybe playing it on a not Nintendo system by a variety of means. You mean um, you were going to pull a Tetra? I, I was... <laughs> Much like Tetra and her band of pirates, I was going to sail the high seas of <laughs> legally dubious gameplay. Uh, although it's not legally dubious because it's legal to emulate games if you have purchased them on the platform that you're of the, the version that you're playing. So there you all, go. It's all good. So um, anywho, we'll see what pans out there. It's going to be a very interesting week. I think that there's no wrong answer here, Matt. I'm very excited to do either one of these. Yeah, I think, I think we're going to have an interesting uh, scheduling challenge either way. Like Twilight Princess is a long game, so that'll be a lot of episodes. And then Majora's Mask is a long game, but not broken up into our traditional format, even more so than possibly Breath of the Wild. Like, I think we're going to have a very Breath of the Wild-esque scheduling challenge here with a, you only have four main things, well, five, including the, six, including the intro and the finale, but four main dungeons, but it's a pretty big game. So that's going to be an interesting uh, scheduling challenge for us. Interesting is the word. We'll find out where we land with that <laughs> later. One of the other benefits that Master Sword patrons and above get is that we read their names every week here on the show. Those legendary individuals are Cosmic Link, Jerry, Dante2, Tom, Gavin, Andy, Stephanie, Billy, Connor, Rachel, Shepherd Street, Matthew, Chris, Daniel, Fallout 907, Tiffany the Star, Daxel, Patrice, Stephanie, Darknuck, Il Maestro himself, Brian, George, Mike, Dylan, Lennon, Melanie, Kolku, Aiden, Rowan, Josh, Nick, Dante1, Gep, Brittany, Davey, Haru, the Mighty, Derek, Albert, Mark, Andy, Cameron, Ben, Daniel, Nick D underscore TV, Travis, Hyrule Interviews, a.k.a. Max Nichols, your guest of the evening, Garrett, and Drew. These are the most legendary of individuals, and as frustrated as I am with the Temple of the Freaking Ocean King, I would allow any of them to accompany us on our last journey into its depths. 
As long as it was our last. Yes. As long as it was our last and we never had to do it again. Yes. Then agreed. you're more than welcome. Also, to our big Goron Sword patrons, we greatly apologize for the delay in the trading cards. But April, May, and June have been completed and ordered, and we are just waiting on them to arrive. Lyndon is diligently working on July and August, and we will get those out to you guys soon. He already knows what the designs are, just trying to put them on digital paper, and we will get those ordered as well. Thank you for your patience, as well as your patronage. Um, And just a reminder, if you need to update your mailing address, please let us know on Patreon via DM, and we will get that updated so you get your cards Thank you so much. Absolutely. But without further ado, let's talk about what we played. We do that every week in the Sacred Realms Rundown, which is a six-part analysis of what we played this week and the feelings that it made us feel. Today, we are covering Phantom Hourglass Chapter 8, The End of the Game. Part 1 of the Sacred Realms Rundown is, as always, the plot recap. This week, read by Matt. Take it away, Matt. We leave the Cobble Kingdom with the last of our pure metals in hand and head to Zaus's island in the west. We finally have everything we need for the Master Smith to create the sword that can destroy Bellum. And when we arrive, he gets to work right away. Crafting a magical sword, however, takes time. So we head back out to the ship to kill some time while we wait. On the way back to the ship, we get another letter from the creepy winged man-child. This one from Jolene the Pirate Queen. She decries her defeat at our hands on multiple occasions, and she is dead set on getting revenge against us and Linebeck, and challenges us to a rematch on the open sea. Knowing that this threat isn't going away anytime soon, we decide to head off this storm sooner rather than later and set sail to find our pirate queen adversary. It doesn't take long for us to run into Jolene's ship and we let her board as she always does. We head to the hold and begin the fight against Jolene and her new moves. She still stands no chance, however, and we easily defeat her once more. As she leaves, she makes a longer than normal speech directly at Linebeck's box in which he cowers, which strikes us as odd. But thankfully, she leaves the ship in defeat and sails away. After Linebeck emerges, we press him for details and get some quick backstory from Linebeck on how he and Jolene used to sail together, and Jolene seemed to be romantically interested in him after he accidentally saved her ship from a sea monster. After a while of traveling together, Linebeck did what he always does and screwed it up by stealing her treasure and running off on his own. He doesn't seem to grasp that she isn't upset about the treasure. But what else have we come to expect from this greedy sea dog? But we aren't here to play Oceanic Matchmaker, so we pack up and head back to Zhao's island to see if our magical blade is finished. We arrive to find the blacksmith hammering the final touches on a long and beautiful blade. The blade of the sword has the symbol of the phantom hourglass etched into the base, and the blade is as long as our wingspan. The eccentric blacksmith has truly made a masterpiece, but it is very notably missing a hilt. As he bids us to take the finished blade, he tells us to take it to the Ocean King for the final touches to the sword. Cradling the sharp instrument of of destruction, we sail back to Merkay Island to meet Oceus and finish the sword. Once there, he fuses the sword with the Sand of Hours and the Phantom Hourglass itself, thereby imbuing the sword with the power to control time. Osha sends us back once again to the Temple of the Ocean King, this time to seek the very bottom of the temple and find the foul creature that has cursed this land and destroy it. We use the teleporter to head back to the midpoint of the temple and start diving in for the billionth time. However, the trip through the temple is made infinitely easier and more enjoyable by the Phantom Sword's ability to slay the phantoms. We can finally render harsh judgment via mystical steel to these obnoxious foes. While we handily dish out long overdue revenge, we make our way back through all the old puzzles and to the lowest floor that we had yet been to. In the room where we obtained the final sea chart to the Cobble Kingdom, Bellum summons a trio of each type of phantom to hinder our path forward. 
Using the phantom sword, we easily dispatch these foes, and the door to the bowels of the temple opens up before us. We head down and find a long staircase leading back up towards the surface. As we cross the bridge to climb the stairs, the bridge collapses into the subterranean river, sealing us in. We have no choice but to climb the stairs and confront our foe. As we reach the top of the stairs, we enter a multi-tiered chamber with a large pool of noxious purple water in the middle. From the liminal space above the pool, a gigantic yellow blob monster with six tentacles floats down to float above the purple toxic sludge. As it floats above the pool, a huge fanged mouth opens up to reveal a glowing eyeball the size of our entire body. It dives into the pool and we join battle with Bellum at last. As it stays below the pool, it covers itself with the purple sludge, thus making it immune to damage from our arrows or, the, or from the beams that Ciela enables us to shoot from our sword. However, our handy grapple hook can remove the slimy armor, and while we run around using the hook to remove the slime, Bellum constantly shoots the purple sludge at us, and wherever this sludge lands, an eye stock pops up to pursue us. Eventually, our grapple hook grabs onto Bellum's body and pulls it to the edge of the pool, where we can give it a good whacking. After the solid thrashing from the phantom sword, Bellum briefly sinks below the purple sludge, only to emerge and fly up to the second level, where it grabs onto the pillars with its tentacles and rains down more eyeball enemies at us. We use the stairs on one side of the arena to head up to the second level, and once up there, Bellum attempts to swat at us like a fly with its eye-laden tentacles. Luckily, we've become a bit of an expert at dodging attacks that are as heavily telegraphed as these are, and are able to avoid any serious harm. While we avoid the swatting tentacles, we use the bow to shoot at the ones holding onto the sides of the arena. And eventually, we drop Bellum back into its purple slime pool. We rinse and repeat these two phases again, and as Bellum becomes more and more injured, it ups the speed and frequency of its attacks, but still is no match for our superior skill. After the second time of throwing Bellum from the top floor, it spits out a glowing green ball of energy, which, which floats in mid-air. Ciela, even though grossed out by this green ball, approaches the ball of energy, saying that she feels like it is familiar to her. As she does, the ball shines blindingly bright and seems to merge with her. Just as she is wondering aloud about the ball, the spirit form of Osis appears and tells Ciela that it was a part of her missing memory, and that it imparted a vital skill to her that we will need to defeat Bellum. Ciela's regained memory allows her to claim the title of the Spirit of Time, as well as the Spirit of Courage. When she combines her power with the power of the Phantom Sword, she can create a time orb, which allows us to stop time for a short period. This is the only way we will be able to damage Bellum as it rampages chaotically below. We head down to the lower level with this new power in our arsenal to finally defeat the beast. As we land on the bottom floor once more, Ciela tells us to summon her power, we need to call upon the Phantom Hourglass. As Bellum begins its chaotic route around the arena, we do so, and the time comes to a screeching halt. For a brief moment, Bellum is frozen solid in mid-air, and we can go to town on his massive eye. One round isn't enough to finish it off, and Ciela needs time to recharge her ability. So we do some fancy footwork, avoiding Bellum, until she's ready, and we bait the beast into charging us once more. Finally, after a few rounds of time shenanigan-induced sword whacking, Bellum begins its death throes. The death of such a powerful beast is no calm matter, and it seems intent to bring the entire temple down around us. As we look desperately for a way out, a huge piece of ceiling detaches and begins to fall. With nowhere to run, we wait for our seemingly inevitable death. But we hit the ground on Linebeck's boat hard. But the fact that it is wood and not stone that smacks our head is the sweetest pain we've ever felt. Osis tells us, and a very shocked Linebeck, that once Bellum was slain, he regained enough of his power to teleport us out of the crumbling temple. As Bellum's death continues, Osis is regaining more of his power. While not all of it has returned, enough has come back that he is able to grant the thing that set us out on this path in the first place. 
Tetra begins to turn back into her human self. Lineback picks up our stunned form and carries us over to witness Tetra's gradual transformation. And as we hover above the ground, we see our friend come back to life in front of our very eyes. Tetra seems to be more or less her old self and is extremely ga- grateful to us for rescuing her. It appears that she was able to more or less watch our journey through dreams while she was encased in stone and knows everything that we went through to rescue her from her terrible fate. She even knows Ciela's and Linebeck's names and thanks them both for their roles in her heroic rescue. I appreciate a terrible fate drop. Thank you. Anytime you feel like making it. Thank one. you. I even capitalized it. TF. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You legend. I, I try. <clears throat> Honestly, we're so glad to see our friend okay that all speech escapes us. After Linebeck drops us, Tetra reaches down with a smile on her face to help us up, just like old times. But as she reaches down, a purple portal of magic opens up, and one of Bellum's monstrous tentacles reaches down and grabs her. It appears that the monster was not felled, and has now reached through space from wherever it has fled to grab Tetra once more. Before we can grab her, Tetra is wrenched through the portal to Bellum, and we can only scramble to the top deck to try to catch sight of the monster. And as we look out over the prow, we see the ghost ship in all its deadly horror, surrounded by a huge unnatural storm. As we look upon it, Bellum flies to the ship, and it becomes completely possessed by the eyeball tentacles and purple sludge of Bellum. Surprisingly, Linebeck seems to have grown a pair and is the first to jump at the chance to challenge the ghost ship. He tells us to man the cannon and fire until the cannons are dry. As we chase the ship through the seas, it shoots the purple sludge at us over and over again, and we have to constantly switch between defending ourselves and attacking the repopulating eyeballs. Every time we miss a sludge ball and are struck, another eye pops up on the ghost ship to take the place of one that we have previously struck down. Eventually, with some great piloting by Linebeck and superb gunnery skills by us, we force the three giant eyeballs of Bellum's possession to show themselves from the middle of the ship. We shoot these as well, and the ghost ship explodes and begins to sink. On the wreckage of the ghost ship, we see Tetra's prone form. She seems to be alive when we rush to get her, only to be stopped once more by the seemingly unkillable Bellum. The tentacle monster flies erratically into the air and strikes the wrecked mast of the ghost ship, which then collapses and promptly strikes the SS Linebeck. The ship goes down, and even more horribly, so does Osis. We are stranded on the floating flotsam of the ghost ship, with no way off, with a terrified and distraught Linebeck and an enraged sea demon that has hold of our unconscious friend and its tentacles. Truly, we can't think of a worse position that we've been in. Just as we think about this horrible predicament, it gets even worse when we feel the horrible coldness of the slimy tentacles wrap us in an iron grip. The phantom sword falls from our grip and clatters on the ground, and we are lifted into the air. To our shock, the sword is lifted in an aggressive pose by Lineback. He swings the sword in a rather ungainly way towards the flailing tentacles and drives them back from grabbing him as well. He even lands a blow on a stray tentacle, which causes Bellum to throw Tetra and us into the air wildly. Eventually, we're brought back to consciousness by Linebeck's frantic pleas for help. We wake up to see Tetra on a different piece of flotsam and Linebeck frantically swinging the phantom sword at the encroaching tentacles of Bellum. Just as we stand up, we see Linebeck ensnared by Bellum, and before the monster can fully engulf him, he's able to throw the phantom sword to us. To our utter horror, Bellum attaches itself to Linebeck's back and completely overtakes him. Linebeck is possessed completely by Bellum and becomes a titanic phantom with Bellum's full power. Just as we are about to dive in to try and save our erstwhile friend and captain, Ciela attempts to use her time-stopping powers, but is also snared by Bellum's tentacles. 
as Bellum now holds two of our friends and our best chance to do real damage, we desperately join battle, hoping that our magical blade has what we need to save our friends. As we cross blades, we find that Bellum's true speed and ferocity come fully to bear against us in a much more visceral way than in the Temple of the Ocean King. The attacks are powerful, fast, and we have no way of hitting El- Bellum's eye on the Phantom's back. We cross blades again and again, and even lock our swords together. As we push the blades against each other, we knock the Phantom off balance and strike its metal body again and again. While this doesn't do any damage to Bellum, it does knock loose the tentacle holding Ciela, and she is able to release a time orb for us. After we collect it, we start closing blades with the Phantom again, and Ciela keeps track of its back for us so that we can freeze time whenever Bellum's eye opens. As soon as Ciela sees the eye open, we freeze time and whip around to do as much damage to the demon as possible. We can only hope that our friend Linebeck isn't in the crossfire here, but we have no way of confirming that, and Bellum absolutely must be stopped. We repeat this process a few more times, and as Bellum comes closer and closer to defeat, it becomes more and more desperate in its attacks. But eventually, it is no match for our blade and Ciela's ability to stop time. Finally, Bellum falls, and we see at last the entire creature dissolve into the final remnants of the sand of hours that it stole from the Ocean King. As Bellum dissolves, the storm around us passes, and the sun shines once more. Linebeck falls to what remains of the deck of the ghost ship, and across the way we see Tetra regain consciousness. Linebeck shakily rises to his feet, and as he very quickly processes the extreme trauma of what he just went through, we're glad to see that he is pretty much immediately back to his old self. Maybe even a little better, seeing as he even apologizes to us for his unwilling part in attacking us. In an even more rare turn of events, Ciela comforts and encourages Linebeck, thanking him for standing up to Bellum when he did. And just as we're talking about the destruction of Linebeck's ship and mourning the apparent demise of Osis, Tetra rejoins us on the main wreckage of the ghost ship. And as we're joining up, the Phantom Sword starts emitting strange energies and launches the Sand of Hours into the sky. The sands explode and rain down onto the sea, and from the area where the SS Linebeck sank, a gigantic white whale breaches the surface and splashes down in glorious fashion. The whale surfaces and begins speaking to us, and is revealed to be the true form of the Ocean King. With the defeat of Bellum, he has returned to full power. The ocean of this realm can now begin to heal, and the troubles that the ghost ship brought to our world will be no more. This last bit catches everyone off guard, and eventually Osis reveals to us that we are not on the Great Sea, nor even in our own reality. The ghost ship captured Tetra and us and brought our souls to the realm of the Ocean King. Bellum hoped to use Tetra's powerful soul to continue strengthening itself and its grip on the Ocean King's realm. But now that Bellum is defeated, we need to return to the Great Sea where we truly belong. Before we go, we have tearful goodbyes to say to our fairy friends and Ciela most of all. And Linebeck still has his one wish, In true Sea Captain fashion, and in keeping with the character that has grown on our journey, he wishes not for treasure, but for his ship, so that he can sail the sea as his heart calls him to do. Ciela and Linebeck say a regretful but still icy farewell, and before we can do much else, we're surrounded by a field of impenetrable white. Ciela calls one last farewell to us, and all goes blank. We wake up next to Tetra on the deck of a ship, and to our immediate horror, it is the intact deck of the ghost ship. But as we regain our wits, we notice that the ship is strangely lifeless, even for a ghost ship, and the weather around us is fair and sunny. We see our familiar pirate ship pull up alongside us, and our crew of misfit pirates seem worried, but nowhere near as panicked or relieved as they should be, given the length of our absence. We board our ship once more, and to our utter confusion, they claim we were on the ghost ship for no more than five or ten minutes. 
Tetra is absolutely furious and continues reiterating over and over again that we were on the ghost ship for a long time and that everything we went through was real. It's real. But all the evidence <laughs> is that it's it, a fake. It was a fake. <laughs> <laughs> Star Trek meme. Culture. I really had to use the yeah, Deep Space Nine you. references yeah, yeah, there. There was no you. other way I to do it, man. You. Yeah. We're even more startled when we turn around to see the ghost ship completely gone without a trace. All in all, we're just glad to be home, safe and sound on the familiar tides of the Great Sea. And as we set sail to find lands beyond those we've seen, we turn to the aft of the ship and see, off in the far distance, the fleeting image of a familiar ship. While it may be just a mirage or a dream, that small ship steaming away into the distance makes us chuckle a bit under our breath and smile with roguish optimism for the future of our journey. Well done, as always, Matt. And you let my cigar die. This brings us to part two of the Sacred Realms Rundown, which is our takes in which we discuss this section of the game and how it made us feel. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring a motion to the table. And if anyone feels strongly that we shouldn't do it this way, let me know. But much like the Phantom Sword is able to dispatch the phantoms in the Temple of the Ocean King with relative ease... I move that we slash the dungeon map completely from this Sacred Realms rundown and just consolidate the whole darn thing into part two. I agree because there is no dungeon. How do you feel about that, Max? Works for me. Alrighty. So let's go ahead and get into part two, knowing now that everything that we played this week is completely on the table. Um, I'm going to send it to you first, Max. Do you feel, generally speaking, like this is a satisfying end to this game? Uh, no. Um, cool. <laughs> I, I think there are a number of ways in which this is an extremely unsatisfying ending to the game. Um, narratively and uh, dungeonly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a word. It is now. Yeah. Um, before we expound, I'm going to go around the table and ask everyone the same question. Matt, do you feel that this was a satisfactory end to this game? Absolutely not. I am neutral on, on this point. I I feel like it does some things well. I feel like it does other things poorly. Here's my issue. Uh, I think there's one thing that this does well. Okay. So here's my issue, and then I'm going to bounce it back to Max. But I think my my initial instinct was to say that I, I didn't like the ending of this game at all. And then once that was done, and I, I was kind of trying to think a little bit deeper than that initial first impression, um, what I kind of came away with was there are a lot of similarities to the end of this game with notable greatest video game of all time, Link's Awakening. And I think that in some ways, the ending of this game comes off as a cheap knockoff of the ending of Link's Awakening, right? Like there, there are comparisons that you just inevitably draw and there's, and, and there's a lot more to it than just there's a whale in it, right? Like it, it's much more than just that. Um, but I think in some ways they are very similar, right? Like the ending of Link's Awakening doesn't have a truly standalone, like, you know, it, it doesn't have a final dungeon to write home about in any significant way. Um, you know, you fight a final boss and then you're presented with a, you know, somewhat like abstract, um, esoteric, like, you know, very heavy thought concept narrative ending to what you've been doing up until that point. So I think in that way that, you know, they're kind of similar. And uh, I, again, I don't think that this game does it as well as Link's Awakening. 
Uh, I, I do think in some ways it does feel like a cheap knockoff of that, and that's inescapable. But I do think that in some ways it's like the, the, the structure of the ending of this game um, is similar enough to that to where it's like, well, I mean, we loved Link's Awakening, so, you know, <laughs> we like we do need to say – that like it, it's unfair to completely knock everything that happens here like to it to to such a a degree you know like well i i, I don't know I'm, I'm trying to like spin together a, a very even keel uh thought process that's that's uh, maybe my, it's, maybe my, it's not working but my kind of take on that is that uh this game copied surface level details of Link's Awakening's ending and did it bad. And Link's Awakening did it good. Like, I think that the fact that there are bullet points in common doesn't excuse this. Sure. Or or make it comparable to Link's Awakening, except as a data point of how to do it wrong. Um. Like, I don't think you need to say because because we praise Link's Awakening, I guess we have to praise this because I don't think that's true. So uh, uh, and I agree with you. I'm just yeah, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate over here. But um, as a a person that I know to be as big a fan of Link's Awakening, if not more than I am, Max, I'm going to bounce it over to you and give you a minute to kind of tell us why you feel that even though there are some similarities, it does not amount to the same. Um, okay. Yeah. So Link's Awakening pulled what in almost any situation is a titanic, uh, narrative sin, which is, it was all a dream at the end. Right. And the, the, the problem with it's all a dream stories is that they, they undo all of the meaning that occurred within the story. Right. Like nothing, nothing, it turns out it didn't matter and the stakes weren't real and, the 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 vic the hard fought victory doesn't matter like those kind of problems arise link's awakening avoids those problems because it is not a cheap rug pull at the end it's something that they essentially tell you straight out halfway through the game and then the rest of the game story is about like struggling with this this question of like should we wake up the, the the whale even though it will destroy this island like um like it and that works well for me it feels earned in link's awakening uh, and it feels like the the waking at the end is a culmination of an arc and not just an undercutting of of a story whereas in this game it's out of nowhere and it f- purely feels like it's undercutting everything that happened. Like it seems like the only thing it actually accomplishes is be a throwback to Link's Awakening and make it make it so that nothing that happened mattered. Um you can do a little bit of mental gymnastics, right? To be like, oh, but it was actually real. It was just a different world. It was an alternate dimension, not a dream. But it's kind of like, why, why did they even do it? Uh that's that's kind of my oh, my high level take on the ending story. Yeah, I, no, I I agree with you completely. I really do. Um, I think that it's one of those things where by the end of the game, I kind of had a very similar thought to what you were just articulating, Max. Which is, I'm not necessarily sure what the point of all of this was, uh, because for the entire time that we were playing the game, I had what I thought was the end point in mind. Which is that, like, I I know at some point in the future, Link and Tetra find a new land, right? Without getting too far into what happens in Spirit Tracks. My understanding of this game was that it ends with them finding that new land. I don't know where I got that. I'm not sure why I had that in my mind. But all of the exploration that we do sort of felt somewhat important because it felt like we were on the same great sea that we had started in The Wind Waker. And we were just exploring more of it, right? Like we were on a voyage that was taking us to a destination, to a place. And um, and so knowing now that the entirety of the game is spent in not necessarily a dream. Like I, I think uh, especially watching all of this before the post credit scene, it really does play kind of like, oh, it was all a dream and none of it was real. 
Uh, and I think what the actual answer is is closer to something that happens in Majora's Mask, right? Like where you actually got shooped into a an alternative dimension, like an alternative plane of existence for the mm-hmm. entire time. So, you know, on the one hand, it's like, yes, this was all real within the context of the world. This this all happened and there were, there were actual stakes, I guess. It's not clearly explained, um, but it definitely was not a dream. Uh, but it has no stakes or importance on the overall narrative that was set up at the end of Wind Waker, which is Link and Tetra set out with the pirates to explore the Great Sea and find a new world, right? Um, like by the time we get to the end of the game, we've advanced that plot not at all, which I, th- I think is the biggest disappointment to me, especially knowing that there is – you know, there are elements of that that are paid off in the sequel to this game. Right. And I think like part of it too, is there were little Easter eggs all throughout the game, Phantom Hourglass that would have indicated that this would have fit nicely into the larger context of the great sea. Like Zao's has a Triforce thing on his wall. Some of the islands are like the Island where you find the fairies is in the Triforce shape. Like all of that stuff is there and present and it why why couldn't this have been part of the great sea why did we have to make it an alternate dimension that doesn't make any sense it was a total unnecessary twist that like i i after i beat the game and before i watched the end credit scene i was just like what the hell just happened like that is so dumb and like the post credit scene helped a little bit but also made it more confusing because Linebeck <laughs> came back to the real world but we found Linebeck in the Ocean King's realm and he had been there for a long time well so I, like, it's like it's what? A, it's a take on what happens at the end of Link's Awakening with Marin with with Marin where the Which, seagull flies off but it's right? a bad take yeah but it's not it doesn't amount to the same thing right because it's like bad. the, the I mean, lo- Mar- Marin's whole character arc is that she wants to see what's beyond the island like that's her whole shtick that's why she likes Link because he represents the outside world to her Linebeck it's like oh he's why why is he no who knows did he make a wish that's not the wish he said a few minutes ago like where where is this even coming from yeah it it, it makes it makes no sense i i just i i i saw that i didn't see the end coming until it happened and it happened and my visceral reaction was what the what? F- <laughs> and like that is not a reaction you want to have at the end of anything. <laughs> except for I like, say I, I probably go ahead. Let it. As a, except for maybe Avengers and uh, infinity war, which did that on purpose. Cause it had a sequel, <laughs> but like what? <laughs> this was so bad. No, it's all you max. Go for it. Oh, uh, I was just gonna say, I like, I may sound a little bit heated, but I, that's just because it's fun to discuss it. Uh, the re- kind of the reality of the experience I had was I went into this ending with very low expectations. So when the game went even lower, it was kind of like, Oh, okay, whatever. I was already expecting kind of nothing, nothing sandwich out of this. And it was now it's a confusing nothing sandwich, but it's kind of, <laughs> I wasn't, <laughs> it's a nothing wasn't like it's a nothing sandwich with a few more <laughs> toppings than you thought it had on it. <laughs> yeah. It didn't actually like, harm the experience too much compared to what I was kind of expecting going into it, which I don't know. Maybe that's kind of sad to hear that I expected such little out of it, but well, I I um, mean, I would say that I'm actually kind of on the opposite side of that because I, I did have some firm expectations of what I thought the story of this game was, which was portraying the voyage of Tetra's pirate crew from the old Hyrule great sea to a new place. Right. Um, and, and like, even when you, when you go onto the Zelda wikis or whatnot, they refer to this as the era of the great voyage. Right. Mm -hmm. And that sounds exciting. Right. I mean, that sounds, that sounds like a story that deserves to be told. Right. And so the entire time that we've been playing this game, I've been thinking to myself, well, this is maybe not the most exciting way to portray the era of the great voyage. Right. Like, uh, 
you know, drawing stylus lines to get your boat from one place to the other and whatnot. It's not the most exciting thing in the world, but whatever. Like I, I like I'm willing to go with it just because of what it represents on paper. You know, we're we're exploring this vast expanse of sea that lays between where we started and where we want to end. And the reality is that we weren't ever doing that at all. And we've really gotten no closer within the boundaries of the narrative of this game uh, to the goal that was stated at the end of the previous one. Um, and it is a direct sequel to Wind Waker, and it's presented as such. Like, it's not even one of those things where you kind of have to draw the narrative lines yourself just based on things Nintendo has said outside of the gameplay experience. The beginning of this game tells you this happened in Wind Waker. This whole crew you're with now is trying to do that we're off trying to do this thing we're trying to find new lands and to do exploration and everything um and it turns out that in the in the grand scheme of the history of the the main world of link and tetra's world we haven't actually done anything because our experiences took place over the course of like 10 minutes in that actual world right so, so there were no yeah. there were no actual stakes um link and tetra went on and hailed some like black mold on the ship and hallucinated <laughs> the other right right and uh, and the thing is I, like i'm just kind of wondering what are what are the actual stakes now i mean was the entirety of the world of the ocean king at stake due to bellum and bellum's influence like that's what the dialogue would have us believe but maybe it's just because i i never really Um, I never really became invested emotionally in too many of the characters that we met while we were, you know, playing this game. Uh, And and so maybe for that reason, it just feels like this all amounts to sort of nothing. Like I, I, I know that what we're supposed to believe is that we saved a whole plane of existence, I guess. Um, Similar to Majora's Mask, right? Like, I I guess on paper, what we have done is basically the same as having stopped the moon from falling on an alternate world, which is Termina. But it just doesn't like, I don't know, the, the consequences of having done that don't feel like they have a magnitude that supports the time that we've spent here so far. And, and that is disappointing. Um, that, that's really upsetting to me. Right. If, if it had been a story about, I don't know, Link, Link has this terrible character flaw. He's a coward. And over the course of saving this alternate world, he learns to overcome that flaw. And at the end of it, he has he has to overcome the flaw and he saved that world. And at that point, it's like it, it had meaning even if the world, whether, regardless of whether the world was real or not, right? Whether it's a dream or an alternate reality, it still had meaning to Link the character. Um, but obviously that's not how this went because link is a cipher uh yeah no ab- absolutely i i don't know i it makes me wonder if there like is there something deeper here than what it looks to be on its face which is just hey we have an an oceanic based game that we have to make and we know people like Link's Awakening so let's try to do something similar to that like I'm trying to find any kind of rationale that kind of explains away the that being the conclusion and it, it's just not coming to me and I think a lot of the reason that that is the case is because we don't get a whole lot of um we don't get a lot of development or motivation behind what turns out to be the main enemy of the game, which is Bellum, right? Yeah. That 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 to me was one of the other big disappointments of this whole section of the game, which is, you know, we've heard about Bellum. All we really knew about Bellum was that it was this evil force that was threatening the life of the Ocean King. And the Ocean King was uh, you know, the the force that was protecting this section of the great sea and so that in and of itself was kind of enough for me to be invested in like yeah sure let's go kick bellum's ass but we get to the end of the game and bellum never really becomes anything i mean other than a boss fight you know it has it's it bellum is not a character it has no motivations um 
it, it we don't even have dialogue with Bellum. Like there's oh, Bellum is like a uh, calamity Gant. Yeah, but even without the even without the like lore setup and backstory that we have to justify Calamity Ganon. Like, even though Calamity Ganon is not a character and is more of a primeval force, we still have got enough to extrapolate why it's important to defeat Calamity Ganon just based on like a familiarity with the lore of the Zelda series and like what Calamity Ganon represents, especially post Skyward Sword. And it's set up well that way within Breath of the Wild. Um Characters will tell you, like, Calamity Ganon is the manifestation of evil that has plagued the Hi- the kingdom of Hyrule over and over again, and Zelda has been working for the past hundred years to delay the reincarnation of that force into, like, an actual character that has agency and, and is capable yep. of doing things, you know? And Bellum just never ever gets there. Like, outside of the Ocean King telling us that Bellum is bad... And we need to destroy it like nothing else ever happens with it. And I just think that that's baffling. Like even I like I'm, I'm trying to think if a final boss in any other Zelda game has had this level of non-development. And I, I really can't think of one. I mean, the nightmares in Link's Awakening even like they're pretty impersonal. They had motivation. Yeah, sure. Because it all feeds in. Yeah. It, it all feeds into the narrative of the Windfish's dream is being encroached upon by these nightmares, which by the way, Link may or may not have introduced into that ecosystem. Right. Mm. It seems that it seems like he did because they all take forms of stuff that he's fought in his past for the most part, besides right. like the genie, right. but the, the nightmares, nightmares at the end are all stuff. That he's right. Fought, yeah, exactly. Right. Like, so I, I think you're right. And I'm really glad you brought up calamity Ganon because, uh, I was thinking, high level about the similarities between Bellum and Calamity Ganning and being just like forces of nature. But I think you really specified why they are intrinsically different and why Bellum doesn't move the needle for me in any way, shape or form where Calamity Ganon at least had some emotional resonance there. And Bellum just does not like the most we know about Bellum is that he just wants to take over the ocean Kings realm and make it evil. Cool. Good. It's good story arc, good character development. Woot. Yeah, it, it really it really just has very big like by the time you've gotten to the end of this game, it just has really big side story vibes mm-hmm. where it's it, it's just like we're not even trying to pretend that this was a narrative that had stakes or a lasting impression on the overall world of the legend of Zelda. Um, it just was like, Hey, here's this fun, goofy little story. We kind of felt like telling and the events at the end of the game just kind of bear that out. Like it really just didn't mean all that much in the grand scheme of things. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I it just, we're talking lore and narrative right now. And I'm going to have more to say about Bellum just in terms of like mechanics and boss fight and how all those events play out here in a minute. But do either of y'all have anything else to add about just like the narrative implications of what happens at the end of this game? <sighs> nah, no. I mean, hopefully, oh. hopefully Linebeck's out there doing Han Solo things. Do like, we do we think that so do we think that the final cutscene was meant to portray that Linebeck now exists as a part of the actual world or was that meant to just be like a symbolic thing? I I think that he's supposed to physically be there for some reason. I don't know. Yeah. Uh I guess I've I've a couple th- notes that's less about the rug pull at the end and more about just the, the stuff leading up to it. Um, I thought it was interesting that they gave they had a, a they had a mandatory Lineback Jolene backstory moment. That was uh, pretty interesting. It, yeah, it it feels like they're trying. They tried like at the last second to like. Um. Okay, so I, I'm going to spoil the Phantom Hourglass manga a little bit, but I just read that last night. Yeah, uh, go for on it. a whim, and the manga introduces a backstory for Linebeck and the ghost ship that's not in the game. And the backstory is that Linebeck was a crew member on a pirate ship and they got cursed. They got cursed treasure 
that turned his ship into the ghost ship. And his backstory is that he was the one surviving crew member because he was a coward and he ran away. So he's Jack Sparrow, but he didn't get he he didn't get marooned. He got he just ran away. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so like the, the, the I feel like this game is trying to tell a story about Linebeck. Like they're trying to say this is Linebeck's story. It's about Linebeck who was who is a coward and he has problems in his life because he's a coward. And at the end, he overcomes his fear to save Link um, and help at the end, which he does do. The problem is that the game doesn't really succeed at at showing this redemption story because it doesn't show anything bad enough that he needs to be redeemed by. Right. (laughs) And I think they tried to do that a little bit with this Jolene moment, like right here at the very end, they're like, Oh yeah, look, he was a scumbag a little bit. Uh, But it kind of just falls a little short. I feel like of actually achieving that goal of, of building a proper redemption arc for him. Yeah. And it's very interesting because talking about Linebeck as a character, I think that from the very earliest moments of the game, we've seen flashes of what could be a good character arc with Linebeck, you know, um, the characterization that they give to him, you know, the whole archetype that he's playing of the coward who is a blowhard who's, you know, like he's, he's pretending he's not a coward, but he, he's never like throwing himself into the thick of things. And he's always finding excuses to not be in the middle of the action. Um, and then we got little teases of his and Jolene's backstory as well throughout the whole game. I think that I was always waiting for the moment that Linebeck really turned the corner and for his arc to really pay off. And I think that even though it is nice to finally find out the backstory between himself and Jolene, and it is nice to see him doing some heroic adjacent things during the final moments of the story. I do think that we never really get to a point with Linebeck where it feels like he was actually developed in the way that maybe they were hoping that he would seem to be. And he also throws most of that out the window with the, farewell or lack thereof with Ciela. Like Ciela tries to like say bye and he's just like stares off into the distance and doesn't say anything. That, it was a weird moment. Like it really was. That was that clanged so hard with everything else in that finale. Like sure they had another little spat with Ciela giving him crap about wanting treasure and then he's like you just always have to have the last word and then just being rude and also not even saying a final goodbye. He's just like, yeah, just pouts about it. Like that was weird. I didn't understand that. Yeah. It, it, uh, it, it definitely felt like they were trying to like portray some interesting, like character chemistry between Ciela and Linebeck throughout this game. Like they tried to have them play off each other and have a relationship and kind of grow together. And it doesn't really ever land for me. Um, for well, reasons like that. Yeah, well, it's just because once you get to the very end of things, you feel like they haven't actually come to a different place than they were at for the entirety of the game, which is a shame because Linebeck does have some great moments in, especially like during the final boss encounters, you know, um, and then especially at the very end where it's like, OK, Linebeck gets his wish and he doesn't wish for treasure. OK, good. Linebeck has had some growth, oh. right? Um, but it's just not taken as far as it could have easily been taken. Um, and I, I think that really is a disservice to the character because I think there was something to Linebeck that was interesting, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think Linebeck was the most interesting part of this whole game, like from a character perspective, easily. Yeah. And, and literally the only thing they had to do to make this a really good finale and conclusion for that character was have him say at least a moderately sincere goodbye to Ciela. It didn't have to be a gushy moment of like, uh, thank you for the, everything you've helped me grow. It could have just been, Hey, see you later sparkles. It's been fun. Like that's it. It could have, it could have just been a, I love you. I know moment. And it would have been, exactly what that character needed but instead they chose to just double down on he had this one moment of of moderate heroics and now he's just back to being a greedy selfish coward 
Like it, they just did a weird flip flop there that made no sense. I, 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 I guess I will say I didn't interpret it as him being a selfish coward. I just interpreted it as like snark. Um, that part didn't stand out to me as discordant like it did to you. OK, well, fair enough. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm reading too much into that, but it, it could have been snark and like his little regretful frown at the end maybe was supposed to do some of that for us. But I don't know. It still just didn't really do it for me. Yeah, I think one of the things that makes it difficult is we are very unclear on what the state of Linebeck as a person is at the end of this game. Like, OK, so we know that we are now in a world that is separate from the one that we've been playing for this in, for the entire stretch of Phantom Hourglass. And Linebeck is maybe here now, but what does that mean for him? Like his meaningful relationships throughout the game have been with link with Ciela and with Jolene. And it seems like by the end of this game, he's now maybe just completely separate from all of those things. And we don't really get an actual end to his character. I, I I still don't know exactly how to interpret what's going on with Linebeck at the end of this game. Like, was he granted passage to the real world? Quote, quote, according to the manga, he was always part of the real world. Sort of. Well, no, the manga still ends the same way. But it, but the manga would <laughs> would would suggest that he was part of the real world prior to being drawn into the ocean. But Kings. in the it sounds like in the manga, the ghost ship is a construct of the Ocean King's reality, right? Which yeah. pulled all of us into it, including Lineback. Right. So in the manga, he still originates in the Ocean King's reality. No, because the I thought the I thought the ghost ship originated in our reality as a conduit to the Ocean King's reality. Like it was an extension of Bellum's power reaching into our world. Unclear. Yeah, I kind of just like they don't give us enough enough to go on to really even speculate on this. Yeah, fair enough. It was seen in both worlds. I guess that means something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say it's it's disappearance from the real world at the very end, though, kind of leads me to believe that, like, I don't know, it it was maybe maybe a spectral aspect of Bellum that was trying to draw people into the Ocean King's reality to, like, prey on them and to increase its own power. Like, I, I really do think that aside from the pirate crew and Tetra and Link, the Everybody else that we meet in this game originates in the Ocean King's reality and also stays there at the end of the game with the possible exception of Linebeck. But I don't know why he would want that to be the case. Yeah, why would he want to exist in a whole different reality? Than yeah, like, is? oh, you got exiled to another world. <laughs> Too bad, Linebeck. <laughs> like, congratulations, yeah. I guess. I mean, I don't know. Like, He gets to see his buddy Link again, but nobody else he's ever known. It's also so disappointing because, you know, throughout the entire game, we were saying things like, oh, hey, we got to Goron Island. Now we know where the Gorons went, you know, like yeah. we didn't really see <laughs> yeah. them during Wind Waker, you know. And so, oh, it was so cool to have fairies back. So I guess they did. Ex they do exist in the Great Sea. Well, maybe they don't. I don't know. Yeah. But now it's just like, well, none of that was actually a real thing that was happening in the world that you're in like what we consider to be <laughs> the real world. So I don't uh, know. That's all that that's a little bit of like, just really take some air out of the room. Yeah, me. I agree. I, Max, I suppose the one last thing I should say about the story, which you two can probably cover at greater length in your recap episode is that I was disappointed for Tetra to be doubly relegated to damsel in distress <laughs> at the end here. <laughs> Yeah, totally. We agree. got like two seconds of her being herself and then she was captured again. Yeah, I think it would have been more fun to have Linebeck be the captured person originally. Tetra take the wheel of Linebeck's ship. We go save him and he still has his heroic stand up. For <gasps> that would have been so cool. Why didn't we get that? That would have been better, right? That would have been so much better. You get pirate. <laughs> cap you, get ca you get pirate Captain Tetra for a moment. And then Linebeck still gets this heroic moment. Bellum just kind of switches back and forth between which one he's going for. Like, like it's so oh. much better immediately. Did, I, I, I may have mentioned this in the discord, but I don't think I mentioned it in my last episode. There's a quote out there of from Daiki Iwamoto, who was the director of this game, where he basically says, I don't like Tetra. <laughs> uh, 
Like, <laughs> well, I can tell. Um, and like, yeah, we can tell, dude. <laughs> uh, it's not not a great look. It's such a shame because, it, I mean, honestly, like, that was one of the things that I was the most excited about this game going into it was the promise of expounding on the Tetra and Link relationship. And, man, I don't know of any way that I could have been more like disappointed yeah. that, that could have been more unfulfilled this one goes out happened. this one goes out to mark e in our discord uh i was excited to see our callous tart become more of a fleshed out character even more so than she was at the end of wind waker and we got the opposite <laughs> womp womp yeah very sad um man i that i so and going back to expectations, so Max having the super low expectations, Lyndon, you having high expectations just based on what this could be from Wind Waker to Spirit Tracks and, and the exploration of the world as we know it. I had high-ish, ex- high-ish, I will say ish, very, with a big capital I-S-H, um, expectations based solely on the last two dungeons and the kind of fleshing out of the story backstory that we got for this area of what I thought originally was a, just another area of the Great Sea. I was like, cool, we're actually like have two good dungeons. We're building some interesting backstory for this area. Um, maybe we're going to get some good stuff going into the final dungeon um, and, a, and a fun boss fight and maybe some more cool backstory. And so like I did go into this with some expectations of like, we're going to continue building on the admittedly short string of good things that have been happening. And instead uh, I think we got a really a return to form of the first bit of this game where it was all just like, seriously, this again with Temple of the Ocean King. Seriously, this again with lack of depth to story and characters. Yeah. And like all of that was just so contrary to what had been very sh- briefly built up that was good. And it made me sad. Um, yeah. So talking about the Temple of the Ocean King, let's get into some actual gameplay discussions here because I know last week I said to you, Matt, that I was hopeful. I like I knew the Temple of the Ocean King was going to be a thing we were going to have to go back into and we would have to get through it to get to the end of the game. And dear God in heaven, I can't believe I'm sitting here saying this. But why didn't we get more floors to the Temple of the Ocean King? Why didn't it feel like an actual dungeon? <laughs> like an, an actual new like dungeon experience? Like, God, strike me down in my seat right now. I'm asking for more floors of the Temple of the Ocean King. Like, <laughs> why? I can't believe I'm saying that. But seriously, I it, it, it just is so anticlimactic because... We are doing nothing new here. All that we're doing is going back through stuff that we've already done, which takes time to do. And yes, there's some slight fun to be had in the fact that you can kill the phantoms. Killing phantoms is great. Killing phantoms is great. It does make the proceedings better. But like, man, it's just, it's not fun at all. It's no more fun than it has been for this no. entire other span. Like, because nope. if the if the thesis behind the Temple of the Ocean King is that, you know, after every dungeon or after every other dungeon, we go back there and we add slightly complex, uh, slightly more complex new experiences within it. You know, if you're the if you're the people designing this game and you think, yes, that sounds fun. That's the thing people are going to want to do. OK, obviously, we take issue with that base thesis, <laughs> right? But... If that is what they if that is what they were thinking, they didn't even carry it forward at the point where it matters the most. Mm -hmm. Like when you go in there and you're at you're more powerful than you have been for the entire rest of the game. You now have a method by which to defeat the phantoms and you have a full suite of items and you're going into the end of the game and you're doing nothing new, nothing at all. The only things that you could possibly do in the Temple of the Ocean King in this section of the game that are different from what you've done before are based on the fact that you now have the hammer and you can do one or two extra puzzles. But it doesn't even matter because, yeah, maybe some of those unlock a chest or something to get a ship you part. get some ship parts. Yeah, <laughs> because, ex- because what I'm going to do right now is abandon 
my Temple of the Ocean King run <laughs> and go slap some parts on my ship and like, then come back and do it again. Like, no, absolutely <laughs> not. It's it's baffling. It is. I cannot believe it. I can't believe it. Um, it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Max, I feel like we're in agreement here, but am I am I a crazy person? Am, am I off base? I mean, tell me if I'm crazy. No, no, it, it, it was it was brutally anticlimactic, right? Like there was a high point of this for me, which was when I realized I could fight, I could kill the phantoms. I suddenly started having more fun in the Temple of the Ocean King than I had at any point in the game. Amen. Um, and that that was good. I liked that. I wish that I had been able to do it, you know, way earlier and that there hadn't been a stealth game at all here. But yes, <laughs> it made me see a little bit of, a, of an Ocean King, Temple of the Ocean King that I might have liked. Uh, one where I wasn't having to sneak. Yes. Um, I did really appreciate the sword upgrade more than most in most Zelda games because, oh boy, I get to kill phantoms now. <laughs> yep. Uh, the uh, but yeah. The, you, and, and by a sword upgrade, you mean the master sword we have at home, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, <laughs> the diet master sword. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> totally not the master sword, right? It's completely legally distinct Dude, from it the master. Literally sword. looks exactly the <laughs> same. <laughs> the model is the same. Come on. You replace uh, the triforce uh, on the hilt with a symbol of the ocean king. That's all you did. I I have a couple notes from my last Temple of the Ocean King run. The biggest one is that I got to floor 10 and then I accidentally rolled, which is a thing I still don't know how to do, <laughs> um, into the warp to take me back to the no. beginning. No, you Max. did not. <laughs> and oh, I had to no. do it all again. I was so bad. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's so horrible. I was very, very unhappy about that. Uh, I have another note that's like, this is kind of a broader note, but it's like the the forces of evil in this game do not feel thematically connected at all. Mm -mm. Like, the phantoms are walking armor. The ghost ship is like haunted, haunted house, undead, ghost ship. And then the Bellum himself is you know, evil, you know, amoeba. And none of these things feel like they belong. We're supposed to like interpret all of these as like stemming from the same evil source, which is Bellum. And it's like, no, these are just like very disconnected things. Like the phantoms, why are they called phantoms? They're not phantoms. A phantom is like a ghost or a mirage or something. This is a hulking suit of armor. Um, Phantoms so. made more sense as a moniker for the little ghosty things that come and steal time from you at the last two floors. They yep. look like little reaper things. By the way, those were just whiz robes. Yeah, that those should have been called <laughs> phantoms. Like the other things should have been iron knuckles. Like, yeah, like that's what they are. <laughs> <sighs> I, I have a note that there's that last room where they spawn nine phantoms. You have to kill them. I like um, that, honestly. And, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. Like murdering nine phantoms after a whole game of having to tiptoe around them was satisfying. Amen. Um, I did have a note that it would have been better if there was any discernible difference between these different types of phantoms. Like they're all kind of just the same enemy and they all die in one hit. So it's kind of like, I guess some of them move faster than the others, but like I just hit them from behind anyways. So mm. yeah. Hey, Max, yeah. They, have, they have different colored armor. All right. So uh, hey, look, some of them move faster, yeah. which doesn't matter yeah. because you just have to hit them in the back anyway. If there's so. any, if there's anything that playing video games for thirty ish years of my life has taught me, it's that killing an enemy who's wearing gold is much more intrinsically oh. enjoyable than killing an enemy <laughs> who's wearing blue. Right. I have another note that I was really excited to get the final floors. And hopeful that they had new music. Psych. Um, that did obviously not come to pass. Uh. <laughs> no. I uh, look, nobody is more disappointed than me that this game just never had 
a truly banger soundtrack to drop on us. I know. Um, yeah, it's really making it hard for you on those audio drops, huh? I mean, in it, it, you have no idea. In some You're ways, right, that is the true disappointment of this game. Is I, I like, don't because you don't let me help edit. Like, uh, if you like, you can't be Zelda and not come at me with good music. I it's inexcusable. I don't understand it. And like, this is something uh, Adventure of Link has in spades. Uh, Adventure of Link's music is so good. And yeah, I I don't know. I don't know. It, like, <laughs> you're, you're completely 100% right. Um, there is one slight exception to this that I am going to mention here in just a second when we actually start talking about the boss battle. So I do just want to say that. Yeah. But um, overall, yeah, very disappointing. And um Anyway, I, I think there's not much else to say about the Temple of the Ocean King past what we've already said, right? Because yeah. Yeah. I, not I, until the bonus episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look, I, we could probably go for another 30 minutes about how we could have made this better, how how much it disappointed us, blah, 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 blah. And we easily could, but I don't think we want to. So I think let's kind of move towards the positive singular slash potentially positive plural. If you have more than one Lyndon or Max, I have, I have only one positive that I do want to talk about. Um, so I'm going to break it up into two positives just to try to balance our scales slightly. Um, I think the, uh, time stopping mechanic that Ciela gets is a fun and interesting mechanic for a boss fight. I, I liked it. I didn't really like the drawing the hourglass until I got it down, but um, it took me a little, just a second to get it down. But once I did, it was it was fine, I guess, in, in comparison to everything else we've done with the stylus. Um, I thought that was a cool, unique boss fighting mechanic that I enjoyed. But the thing that I mainly enjoyed was the very, very last the third final boss fight against Bellum where he's uh, just gigantic phantom that has taken over uh, Lineback. And I, I really enjoyed that boss fight. I liked the uncertainty of like, dang, how am I supposed to hurt this boss? Like I can't get its eye. I tried, I tried a ton of things to like stun it or hit its back. I tried to boomerang it like the Zora warriors. I tried to bomb it. I tried to arrow it. I tried to uh, grapple it. Like I did all the things until um, I got into the sword clash mechanic, which I'm just now realizing they introduced to you in the last Jolene fight is the first and only time besides the final boss ah. fight where you are introduced to the, sh the sword clash mechanic. So that was cool. And I enjoyed how that fight progressed and it felt frantic. It felt difficult. It felt uh, visceral, I think is the word I used in the plot recap. And, and I, I liked it a lot. I really did. I thought the very, very last boss fight was really good. Um, and I'm glad that we didn't kill Lineback in the process. So there you go. Those are those are my two positives. I guess three if you include the Jolene yeah. so, introduction. So what we're, what we're getting into now is a discussion about the actual mechanics and flow of the boss fight. And so let's have a larger conversation about that. Um, I, I'll go ahead and start. Or I guess, Matt, you technically started, but I'll, sure. I'll take it from where you left it off at and just say that I think as a boss fight with all three – well, hmm, I think two of the three phases of the Bellum boss fight are – Really fun. I agree. Um, I enjoyed them. I think that uh, the first phase where you're kind of like going between multiple levels within that arena and having to do multiple things, uh, I thought that that was all a good time. And I thought that it was yet another example of interesting ways that the two screens could be utilized together to create interesting angles or whatever. I thought that it was fun. I had a good time with it. Um, no real notes. I, you know, Good stuff. And, and similar to you, Matt, I thought that the third phase where you actually have to fight possessed Linebeck was really great. I thought that that had some real atmosphere taking place on like the destroyed hull of the ghost ship was a really great time. And again, talking about ways that you can utilize two screens at once, I thought it was really fun that the top screen becomes Ciela's view, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that that was really clever and having to manage those two things together 
um, I thought was uh, was really nice and I and also distinct from anything else that you've really done in the game so far. Like, I, I think it's kind of a testament to how you can take the two screens and just do a ton of different things with them, because I think the two screen setup for all the bosses has been pretty different in execution from each one. Like, we're not r- really redoing a whole lot here. Um, we're not just doing a warmed over version of something that's happened earlier in the game, which I, I think is nice. Um I do think that the time stopping mechanic is fun and I enjoyed it. I really wish that that had been set up in some way in the game previous to now. (laughs) Right. Like I think that's (laughs) like some hint of that would have been really nice to have even in the last two dungeons or so. Like also why does Ciela get to be the spirit of two things? Right. Exactly. Like that was that was so weird like, and like and hey by the way i'm the spirit of time too i guess yeah like, like that bumped me so hard like, out of the whole boss fight which i already wasn't that into anyway like <laughs> like neat good cool, cool all right and osis's uh phantom just like showing up and being like cielo that's your memory i am the deus ex machina who's gonna explain this whole thing to you and i'm just like what the f- on <laughs> it's it's emblematic of one of my overall problems of the game, right? Where like stuff doesn't feel like it's interconnected in a thematic way, right? Like there there aren't details that build upon each other and build towards shared goals. It's kind of just like there's so many one-off things going on in the story, in uh, I mean, in the dungeon designs. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it feels like it feels like story stew that just has been sitting too long and separated like you've got some of it on top and then some of it's in the middle and there's the dregs at the bottom and it's just like it didn't mesh together at all like a like a bad cake or a bad um souffle it it just does it doesn't not work together at all which is really disappointing yeah it it feels like a fairly amateur game to me uh-huh. Like the hallmark of a of a in game design and in, in many other art forms, really, there's this idea that like every time you make a choice, it should reinforce all your other choices towards a a high level vision that you have, right? And like, um, so you're not you shouldn't be making a choice in of in by itself you should be considering how it impacts all the other choices and i'm talking in a very abstract way right now because i'm tired but uh <laughs> um and one of the things that separates a someone who has a lot of experience from someone who doesn't is someone who has a lot of experience is going to be better equipped to understand how all the different things that they're building interrelate to build towards a shared experience um so when i play this game i'm like it feels like it feels like it's the whole team's first Zelda game. And that isn't the case. Some of these people ha- at this point will have been on Zelda for many years. Um, but it was, you know, it was the director's first time directing. It was Iji Onuma's first time being producer uh, Whoa, for a Zelda game. Wait, this was Eiji Onuma's first time producing a Zelda game? Yep. <laughs> well, I guess there's nowhere Prior to go to this, but up from here. All- I mean- yeah. <laughs> Prior to this, all the previous Zelda games he'd worked on, he'd been a director or lower, um, one of many directors on Ocarina of Time. Uh, so this was his first producer run. Mm. Also, this was the first game that uh, Hidemaru Fujibayashi worked on at Nintendo. He got hired, I think, partway through production of this and was like assistant director or something. Uh, but I'm pretty sure he came in pretty late. Sorry, I got off track. There. No, 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 it's okay. I, I'm curious, Max, how, just mechanically speaking, like as a boss fight, how do you feel that this works? I mean, do you feel like there's some fun to be had here? Do you think that it's well constructed? Yeah, I, I actually like this boss fight. Um, I think it continues the trend of this game having good boss fights that feel different from each other and make imaginative use of the uh, you know, the camera and the, the dual screens. Uh, is this the only boss fight in the game where you you 
rotate around a space because you can like run around the outskirts no the no. temple of muto does that one yeah the the big stone it, oh bad guy right, in, i forgot about that one in muto um so it's not the only time it's happened but it's a cool thing to do because it's like totally different than top down like it's not top down at all this is a third person boss fight right um which is kind of funny to think about well, and it, it really gives this whole arena a sense of scale, which is really nice. Like that does go a long way. And it's one of those things where top down Zelda games traditionally have kind of a hard time establishing that sense of scale. And that was one of the things that I was kind of mentioning last week in our discussion of, of the Temple of Muto's boss, um, where that just that really did feel like a giant cavern where you were fighting this immense construct, you know, and. Yeah. And I do think that this arena works in a similar way. Um, and, and that really does help. Like that helps pull you into the atmosphere of the thing. Um, you know, it's one of those things where I don't know how many of the decisions that are made in this game are things that I'm like, oh, whoever's making top down Zelda games, if those continue to exist going forward, um, should like pull ideas or inspiration from past things I'm like i'm not sure how much phantom hourglass really contributes to that conversation um but this is definitely one of those things where i'm like okay there was an interesting thing being done here which helped kind of create some scale within this world yeah and i do think it helps um and i do think it's impressive that they were able to pull it off in that way i will say so I, I said just a minute ago, phase one and three are very fun of this boss fight. Um, there's just really not a whole lot that I get out of the whole ship combat section, right? Um, oh, right. Yeah, well, I was know, sitting here like, what is phase two? You know, honestly, I'm going to disagree. I think I, I liked the ship combat more than I think I liked the first round. I thought the first round was kind of boring. Like he's spitting little eye stock blobs at you. It just doesn't feel very dangerous to me, I guess. I actually died in the ship combat part the first time because I wasn't focusing on shooting the blobs that he was spitting at you because I didn't realize if you got hit by one, it replenished one of the eyes that you had previously shot. So I was just like full offense. I wasn't playing any defense. So I actually, I think I enjoyed the ship combat more than the first phase. Um, Mostly because in ship combat and the rest of the game, you're having to both uh, steer by drawing and also um, shooting. And this time I could just focus on shooting. So that one felt a little bit better to me. And also it just felt more dangerous because I guess I died. The other in, <laughs> in first phase, I only lost like two hearts because nothing actually did that much damage to you. I was anyway. going to say Matt, I think you might be alone in this one. Probably. It's totally fine. Um. Yeah, I don't know. It it just didn't do a lot for me. I mean, it's not that I think shooting the cannon is inherently unfun. Um, yeah, especially when it's just like dinky little enemies on the Great Sea or whatever. It's fine, I guess. But like just spamming shots against this target uh, while the ship is being steered for you. There's just not a lot to get into there. And I don't know. It, I, it's not like I hated it. I mean, I wasn't like pulling my hair out. I think I think out, doing this or anything, I think but. outside of the fact that it felt more dangerous to me, it also felt like an actual sea based game for the first time in the entire game. Yeah, like we were actually I, participating in ocean combat on a ship against another ship, and like that was really the first real time that I was able to do that, and that felt kind of cool to me and that that's all that's as deep as it gets honestly like this was not mechanically interesting at all but it felt neat yeah i'm i'm kind of in the same boat as you matt i i thought it was thematically fun um i think it would have felt like something was missing if we didn't go back to the boat mm -hmm. uh to, to a certain extent at least and and yeah like the mechanically it's it's not a lot. It's it's basically just a tap as fast as you can and occasionally remember to tap the right thing instead of the wrong thing. Um, yeah. I, I, I appreciate seeing the ghost ship again because I think the ghost ship is the most interesting antagonistic force in this game. The ghost ship should have been the main boss instead of Bellum. Yeah, I so that that is an interesting thing to bring it back to because I know after the ghost ship episode, we were kind of saying like, all right, well... 
this was a really cool sounding thing, but it seems like now we've got like our Ganon and Zant moment here, right? Where it's like, but here's the actual <laughs> bad guy, you know? Um, and I do like how it does kind of come back around and it's like, hey, the, the ghost ship was always just an aspect of Bellum and he has now possessed it and you're fighting against it. And I do think that there is something there and I think that it is admirable that it shows back up um, as part of this fight. So that is nice. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I don't know what I wish that they would have done to make it just a little bit more mechanically interesting. Um, because it, we're working within systems that the game has established, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they couldn't at this point suddenly make ship combat fun. <laughs> like, yeah, that wasn't true. really in the cards. The only really thing they could have done is add complexity of having to jump at the same time as trying to shoot. So like put more stuff in the water for you to jump over. I feel like that would have made it too frantic, though, and then it would have been less fun. Hey, so, you know what we should have done, Matt? Once made you, it harder. <laughs> once you shoot the ship enough times, uh, a piece of bellum falls into the bottom of the ocean and you have to do a salvage mini game. You shut your whore, you shut your whore mouth. You shut it right now. Amazing. I think that sounds amazing. I don't know. No, um, kidding. Um, all right. Uh, does anybody else have anything that they want to say about the boss fight and its mechanics before we move on to just kind of wrapping up this section and getting on into some other stuff? No, I uh, uh, I don't. Sounds like Max does, but we do still have uh, Bloopy Trails, Z targeting, and final oh, thoughts. We're gonna get there. Cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, just real quick, I found I thought the actual final phase uh, was not amazing. Uh, I had a pretty hard time understanding what the mechanic was. I actually, I like, I went through, I, up until this point, I'd essentially taken no damage this whole time. I took a little bit from the first phase. And then I, in this phase, I spent like two full potions and half of my heart containers after the second potion, like trying to figure out like, what do I even do? I ended up looking it up because I didn't feel like redoing stuff. And I was afraid it would make me redo a lot if I died. Um, and then like the, the actual answer is you need to hit, hit the sword once or twice, and then hit it again at the right timing when they're, the boss is coming at you from the side. Um, and I, that just was not clicking for me at all. Um, so I, I kind of was frustrated by that. And then the rest of it was, you know, it was fine. It felt like I was fighting a one of the Zora warriors with a lot of health. Um, emotionally, I was like initially like, oh, no, Lineback. I don't want to hurt you. Like I'm afraid for you, but then it kind of settled into like mechanical frustration instead for me. Mm. Yeah. I will say the game has not done any kind of tutorial up until this point of like, this is how you duel. Like this is how you get into a sword fight with another character. Um, and I, I, I think that is a little bit of a failing of that final phase. Um, because it, yeah, if you don't know that that's what you're supposed to do and there's no prompts on the screen telling you that you're supposed to do it, then yeah, you're just, you're trying a bunch of stuff and all you're doing is getting hit by this, this dude's sword over and over and over again. And I can, I can see that being a very frustrating experience for sure. The setting was really cool though. Yeah, no, totally agree. Zelda games, final bosses, there's a high bar in the Zelda series, but this one was pretty good. Yeah, agreed. I, I actually do agree. I think uh, I, I actually think that as a setting and in terms of mechanics, uh, this is actually a much more fun final boss fight than, say, Link's Awakening. Right. Um, you know, but uh, that's about the, and that's fair. That's about the only leg up that it has over over any of that, to be completely honest with you. It's it's <laughs> less it's less fun than the uh, Thunderbird. You thought Thunderbird was more fun than this? Oh, what am I saying? No, other way around. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, okay, cool. <laughs> Just, I was thinking, when, so I remember, I remember thinking this very specifically. The first phase, when we finished the first phase and I originally thought the game was over, I was like, that was not nearly as fun as Thunderbird or Dark Link in AOL. And then we got phases two and three and I was like, okay, we're, we're back to better than. Okay, but like marginally. Fair enough. Than. 
All right, let's go ahead and move on forward. We uh, we took the Phantom Sword straight to part three, and so we're skipping over that and going into part four, which is Bloopy Trails. Probably not going to be too much to talk about here. Um, I will say last week I said that I was going to go do the trading quest. I went and I did the trading quest. As did I. So, cool. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> neat, I guess. Look, uh, so Ugh. one one of the things that made this inherently sort of unfun for me to do was that I had already discovered all of these traveler ships mm-hmm. while I was just like out playing the game. And so I already met the dude who is like pretending to be Link on the corpse of the King of Red Lions. Mm-hmm. I had I had already met all the members of the Hoo Ha tribe in their <laughs> in their little boat, right? Um the only person I had not met like so the the crazy guardsman in his boat. Yeah. Right? Who like looks at you really creepy and says, "It's always nice to get a gift." Like, <laughs> like, oh Ugh. man, you're a Ugh. weird dude. Yikes! Um, why, well, why not are the man of smiles? Yeah, I was about to say, why are he's... half of the people in the trading quest like borderline psychopathic? He is killers? not the man of smiles, who is the only unique person that I met in my course of doing this, and uh, in a not good way. And we, yeah, exactly. And we talked about the man of smiles last week, so I'm not going to belabor the the discussion too much. But yeah, interesting character. But I really do think. Um, as far as trading quests go in Zelda games, just it's it's just not up there, you know. No, it's it's a horrible trading quest, which like, is a shame because actually all four of those characters, a uh, five, I should say, because yeah, because we way, go back the to the Wayfarer. Wayfarer. Yeah, all five of those characters are actually pretty interesting and fun characters, yeah, right? Like they're, they're neat enough. Link, doppelganger, the Hoo Ha Tribe. The the Wayfarer, the Man of Smiles, like these are all actually very Zelda feeling characters. Yes, you know? agree. Um, and so I, I have to give props for that. But it's just because I, I had met them all before, really. Yeah, I, I think the thing that most stood out to me about the trading quest was seeing the old Wayfarer get back on a boat to go. <laughs> he was literally trying to make money for his sugar baby. <laughs> like <laughs> right, literally like, all he's trying to do is like, like the ultimate creepy end to that story. Right. Is so that, bad. Like, <laughs> his, his sugar daddy lifestyle has like driven him into poverty and now he has to just go find more treasure or money or whatever somewhere else. <laughs> like, wow, <laughs> this is no less dysfunctional than it has been throughout the entire rest of the game. But I guess it's fun. <laughs> it was certainly an interesting, uh, interesting character arc decision that Nintendo made with this one for sure. Uh, but it was at least kind of out of the normal mold and interesting. So I'll, I'll give it that. Max, do you have anything you want to say about Bloopy Trails before we move on to Z targeting? Uh, I did the same thing as you two. I did the trading choice. Um, and I just, it didn't make much of an impression on me. Uh, I think a lot of it is is just due to the timing of when this was happening in the game. The the game leaves it until the very end, basically, and it's it's kind of a strange choice. Um, and like I don't remember some rando character I talked to on a ship in the first quadrant ten hours ago. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it didn't make much of an impression on me. All right. Agree. Cool. Well, let's okay. Move. Actually, I have a question before we move on. Did either of you collect all of the spirit gems? Absolutely. Freaking not. Max, did nope. you? Okay. I didn't either. I collected enough to get the first upgrade for each fairy. And after that, I was like, I genuinely don't want to play this game enough to collect the rest of them. Yeah. Well, for me, it was just a matter of like going and looking up the rewards that you get from doing that and realizing that. I don't think that that is worth the time investment of actually going in and doing all of this. I think I probably actually had enough courage and wisdom gems to go and get the upgrades mm-hmm. for those. First but, tier or second tier? First. Okay. But knowing that that would require me subbing out the flame sword. Yeah. Like you just keep flame sword always. And, and like always knowing keep that those sword. upgrades aren't as cool. Like, mm-hmm. I, like why would I do that? You yeah. Know? Uh, I th- I think it's it's very interesting because normally in any other game, any other Zelda game, any game in general, really, if I had the opportunity to have a four times damage upgrade, I would go all the way out of my way to make that happen. Like there's nothing keeping me from a quadruple damage upgrade in any game if I know that it exists um, in this game. I don't think you could have 
done anything other than pay me money to go track down all the power gems to get quadruple damage upgrade. Like, I just have no interest in doing that. I mean, I will say I wasn't missing the extra damage. Neither was I, and I think that's a big part of it, is like, I don't... It didn't feel necessary. The defense upgrade doesn't feel necessary. The Except for, like I said, the only time I died was on the ship combat, and your defense upgrade has nothing to do with your ship. You have to go track down ship parts, and yeah. there's no way in hell I'm doing that. No, absolutely not. But that's like, so in A Link Between Worlds, right? I mean, uh, by the time you're at the end of the game, if you haven't gotten your tunic upgrades, and if you haven't been upgrading the Master Sword, then you are at a severe disadvantage. Yeah, real right? bad. Yeah, like you're struggling out there. And um, I feel like I was doing just totally fine without Mm -hmm. messing around with any of that Mm -hmm. in this game. So I feel like there's like a fundamental economy issue at play here. Yeah, I think it's that. And on top of that, I didn't enjoy exploration in this game enough to want to do that by itself. Like in a lot of games, and I don't, necessarily need so i'm going to take this to a non-zelda game in mass effect one i don't need specter 10 weapons on every single slot for all of my characters but i want specter 10 weapons in every single slot for all of my characters even if they can't use them because i like this game so much that i'm gonna go do what i need to do to make that happen in a link between worlds in uh, a link to the past. They, is that where they have the the first introduction of the different? No, it's Link's Awakening. Link's Awakening with the different colored tunics. Like I want those things because I like these games. Link to the past was first. It was first. Okay, yep. I wasn't crazy. I I like second guessed myself and I shouldn't have. Link to the past. Link's Awakening. Like these games. I like these games so much that I want to play them more to get optional things. Because it it introduces me to other parts of the game that have different challenges that I enjoy. This game did not incentivize me via exploration being enjoyable or via needing them to survive the final encounter. And with neither of those things being the case, I had zero interest in, in upgrades in this game. I just naturally got enough upgrade gems to get the first tier upgrade for everything. And like you said, just stay on power, stay on fire sword. Just, duh. I don't know that I could say it any better than you just said it, Matt. Like there, like if you're gonna implement systems like this, then there has to be an intrinsic um, draw to pursuing that, right? And then there has to be an immediate payoff once you've actually accomplished some level of it, right? Um, and if you don't have those things, then what's the freaking point? Yeah, you know, totally agree. Yep. Which I feel like is probably a balance that you're constantly trying to strike in your work as a designer of gameplay systems, Max. <laughs> uh, yes, this is this is very hard to, or very easy to mess that kind of balance up. Well, that's all good because we can shoot right past where we are now to the next section, which is going to be Z targeting, where we talk about fascinating characters or enemies that we happen across. Max, I'm going to ship it to you first. Who's your Z targeting pick for this week? Oh, uh, I mean, I'm going to pick Lineback, which is, I don't remember. I probably picked Lineback my first episode, too. Um, but I basically think all of the interesting characterization in this entire game went to Lineback and nobody else. Um, <laughs> it's the only memorable character in the whole game, but at least he is quite memorable. He's got that fun personality and he got the climax of his character arc in this episode, which was him overcoming his cowardice to help. Inle- uh, unless I'm really off base, I think you picked Jolene in your last episode. So I don't think you're I don't think you're re- redoing anything right now. I don't think you're breaking any rules. <laughs> um, yeah, I, and, I, and I think most of what else I would say about Lineback, I've already said. So I will leave it at that. There you go. Matt, how about you? <sighs> Uh, I was going to pick Lineback, but I think Max did it well, so I'm going to go with Osis. Um, turning into a giant white whale seems pretty neat. I'm happy for him. He's he's back to his normal, gigantic self, uh, benevolent over, over uh, overlord of the Ocean King's realm. Yeah, I'm happy for him. 
Okay. And apparently he was a benevolent enough ruler that the whole Cobble Kingdom like owes their prosperity to him. So like, go do more of that. Even though they're extinct? Well, but at the time that they were, <laughs> I think they went extinct when Bellum like jacked him up. So oh, okay. Okay. That's yeah. fair. That's yeah. Fair. So like, go Ocean King, create a, a paradise for all people to live in prosperity. Cool. Huzzah. Right. Fair enough. Uh, so I'm going to pick Tetra. Outside of, outside Why? of, outside of any <laughs> legitimate reason for doing so, <laughs> it feels wrong to get out of a season of Sacred Realms without the Zelda character having been a Z targeting pick at some point. So, uh, look, Tetra doesn't deserve this at all, but <laughs> regardless, honorary Z targeting. Did deserve how she was treated in this game? No, no, she did not. No, <laughs> she did not. Um, it's very sad and we're all upset about it, but uh, hey, uh, I'm going to pick Tetra for the potential of what she could have been and wasn't. All right, honorary Z targeting for Tetra. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. Notice uh, how none of us gave it to Link ever. I don't think we ever gave it to Ciela. Link has never been more of a cipher than he is in this game. He's just like he's I, he's I a whole lot of even nothing. In, in the in the in the whole canon of top down Zelda games, maybe a link to the past. He's more of a cipher than he is here, but I still have questions about that because like even in a link to the past, like a family member of his dies, right? Yeah. Um, at Link's Awakening, like sure he doesn't talk a lot, but there there's actually there's stuff happening there right like you like via conversations with other characters mm -hmm. you can imprint a lot upon him um and yeah the, like this version of link is has just got nothing going on there's it's, nothing there and and that's after wind waker link who was arguably like top three top five links like man how much did they just absolutely slaughter some beloved characters yeah yep no Ugh, right. it's right. so sad all right let's move on to part six which is our final thoughts in which we're going to let matt wrap up this section of the game in as succinct a way as he can think to do it sucked can you <laughs> give me a little more <laughs> <laughs> well done as always matt <laughs> yeah i mean uh okay um since i have to um we get to the final section of the game where we trudge yet again through the ocean king's temple we at least get to kill some phantoms on the way uh we get some moderately interesting boss fights with bellum then we get a another moderately interesting boss fight with bellum then we get another moderately interesting boss fight with bellum uh leading up to the absolutely confusing and blatant ripoff ending from Link's Awakening to Phantom Hourglass, and we end up back on the Great Sea. And uh, yeah, here we are. I love the energy you're bringing to this, Matt. It's spectacular. <laughs> Thank you. You're I mean, a legend. That's just kind of how I felt about it, man. All right. We mentioned it at the top of this episode. But we have a very important decision that has to be made now because our next episode is going to be the rank and recap for this game. And a recurring point of conversation throughout this entire season has been whether or not we feel that Phantom Hourglass deserves to be above our current bottom pick, Zelda 2, in the ranking. Which is usually something that we would hash out in the rank and recap episode. The problem is that our third member for those episodes, Mike the Detective, has played every game that we have played except for Zelda 2. Which means that if Matt and I find ourselves in a deadlock, then we need a tiebreaker. Um, if Matt and I both agree that Phantom Hourglass is better than Zelda 2, then there, there's no problem. Or vice versa. Or vice versa. But if one of us feels one way, one of us feels the other way, then, you know, we have to have somebody who's informed in the decision to come in and, and cast a tiebreaker vote. So um, our guest of the evening, Max Nichols, has been designated to be that tiebreaker vote. And Max, I know that we have spent this entire episode kind of dogging on Phantom Hourglass and the way that this game ends, but... Am I correct in saying that this is actually somewhat of a difficult decision? Yes. Um, so I've actually been 
like I wouldn't say agonizing, but like I have been chewing on this question for weeks now because I, I found it to be very hard um, and very kind of apples to oranges. Uh, for a bunch of like when I first started this, I was unsure. And then I. Well, hello there, eager beavers. Look, I get it. It's a big deal. You want to know which way Max votes. I understand. And in some ways, I think it's cruel to be leaving you on a cliffhanger. But in some other ways, I want to give you every possible reason to tune into next week's episode and find out. So just going to keep it all in one tidy place together. If you want to hear the rest of Max's answer to this question and find out whether or not it has any bearing whatsoever on the Sacred Realms ranking, you're going to have to tune back in next week to the Phantom Hourglass rank and recap episode, and we'll drop it in there. I made the decision as I was say talking. About <laughs> it. I, I mean, I think that's where I'm going to be at with it. Like I, I did play a little bit of um, Adventure of Link this past week. Not a lot, like just the first, literally the first level. Um, and I enjoyed it. Honestly, I, I had a decent time with it. I think I'm going to make myself play at least through Death Mountain again. Oh, because, wow. I mean, that's good on, no good on you. That's like the part where we all just like started really shitting on that game right like if i'm gonna be honest with myself about comparing the two i have to get to the bad part or the the bad 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 part right so i like yeah i don't want to spoil too much of next week's conversation but like i i think your point max about the two games are very hard to compare i think it's really true because the things that annoy us so much about phantom hourglass are very different than the things that annoy us so much about adventure of link and you know what is a product both are a product of their time right like both are very much a product of that period of game design in general and that period of zelda game design so you just kind of have to sit there and think about which one and and i have to think as a voting member, which one to me is more or less frustrating or bad and trying to frame it that way when they are just very, very different games is going to be a very challenging, uh, part of, I think the most challenging part of ranking that we've had ever, in my opinion, I really do think that this is going to be the hardest ranking we've ever done. I agree. Completely agree. It really should have been Skyward Sword versus Wind Waker, but we all know how that turned out. Yeah, well, you got absolutely (laughs) massively outvoted on that one. (laughs) Like, not even close. Just a smidgen. Hey, look, to be fair, I did have a moment's Uh consideration. Yeah, yeah, I did. I really did. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the Sacred Realms Rundown. We will be back with another installment of the Sacred Realms Rundown in two weeks when we begin covering whatever the hell game we're playing next. No idea. No idea. <laughs> uh, it's going to be, be three weeks because we have the rank and recap. Oh, and yeah, we yeah, have yeah. The, okay, three weeks from now. Yes. So then we have the bonus we, episode. Look, we will, via social media, we will give everybody plenty of notice about which game we're playing next. Uh, you can look forward to that before the end of this week if you're listening on Wednesday uh, by Friday. We should it's be able Saturday because it ends midnight Friday. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll let you know and uh, you can start getting all that together. But um, – until then, Max, this has been a really fun episode. Uh, we typically do really long ones, and I think that's for good reason. Like we, we I think I, I love having you on the show because um, you bring a very analytical eye to all of these things, and that really helps us break it down and maybe maybe give like scientific voice to the reasons that Matt and I are feeling certain things. Um, and I always appreciate that. So. Once again, thanks for coming on the show and for, you know, for having that perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad I get to share it. I spend half my career thinking about game design through the Zelda lens. Uh, (laughs) I love every excuse I get. So I have to ask you, Max, before we get out of here, if you were to personally, uh, I, I know you've probably already cast a vote in the, uh, in the Patreon poll, but if you were to have your druthers, would you rather be playing Phantom Hour? God, why do I keep doing that? Can you like get it together, please? <laughs> is there something? Is there something about Twilight Princess and Phantom Hourglass that are just the P? They each have a P, and that's a very uncommonly. Why, why used. am I doing this? Think of two. Think of one other Zelda game 
two other Zelda games that have a P in it. I need um, Link to the Past. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's it. Okay. Minish Cap. Spirit Tracks. Dang it. All right, fine. Uh, okay, dear God in heaven. <laughs> Max, if you had your druthers and you could go on to play next either Twilight Princess or Majora's Mask, uh, which one would you be voting for? I voted for Majora's Mask. Ooh. Uh, and primarily it's because uh, I, my wife will watch me play that one. Because she's always wanted to see Majora's Mask. That's she a likes good reason. Aesthetic. That is a good reason. And she's also told me that she will finally listen to an episode of this podcast that I'm on if it's about Majora's Mask. All right. I so think there's those n- are my reasons. <laughs> there's no better reason that, that can be had. My wife has listened to exactly one episode of this podcast, and that is the first one. And I think. Oh, just, that's the worst one to listen I to. I think she just wanted to know that we had like actually done it and it was real. So. <laughs> and now she's listened to us do 110 of them. I know, right? <laughs> or however many we've but, done. What? Really, both both games are amazing, and I will be excited about either one. Yeah. So there's, there we're all winners here. I actually am very excited for next season, no matter which one wins. I yep, think I, I really, as much as we've kind of shat on Twilight Princess in our previous like talking through our history with the game, I'm super excited to get back to. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I can't wait. Like, I I really I I can't wait to play it. Yep. Yep, going to be good no matter what. So we'll see how that pans out. Next week, we will be back with the Rangan recap for Phantom Hourglass, and that should be a banger. (laughs) It's going to be interesting. We'll see what happens. Uh, Max, um, before we get out of here, let's go ahead and give everybody a reminder about where they can follow both you personally and also all the awesome work that you're doing over at Hyrule Interviews. Yeah, so uh, I run a Zelda fan site called HyruleInterviews.com, which is a database of interviews with people who have worked on Zelda games. Um, you know, the stated goal is to get all of them into the database. I'm not going to achieve that, but I'll, I'll keep trying. Uh, I post daily quotes on Twitter and on Instagram. If you just search for Hyrule Interviews, you'll find them. Um, and uh, you can find my professional work at Destiny 2 the video game. Uh, I work on the seasonal team for that game. So uh, I won't go into more detail than that because it's a big team effort every time. But uh, yeah, that's my day job. This is the point in the podcast where I mentioned that Max Nichols is my colleague. Damn it. (laughs) (laughs) I thought we were going to get through one episode. I I really thought. I don't know why. I thought we were going to get through one episode without that coming up. I can't let that pass. Can't let it slide. It's a big deal. I hate you so much. Right. Uh, I totally <laughs> encourage all of you to go follow Max and uh, definitely uh, follow High Rule Interviews. I will say that um, the stuff that you dig up on a pretty regular basis, and you know the little snippets of interviews and things that you drop during discussions within the Discord and also on social media, it's very enlightening, and it's stuff that I don't think like even though Zelda has a pretty mainstream following within the realm of video games. Um, It's context that a lot of people just don't have. And I think, uh, you know, original language is a part of that, right? Like most of these interviews happened in Japanese or uh, happened with now defunct um, media outlets and whatnot. And so I I would imagine that it's like a monumental task to assemble uh, anything, Um, but it is massively helpful. And so, yes, if you're listening to the show, go give Hyrule interviews a follow because um, it's just really fascinating stuff to go check out. But uh, Max, until we talk next time, which is going to be two weeks from now, been a lot of fun, man. Catch up with you later. Okay. Yep. See you around. All righty, y'all. If you enjoyed today's show and you would like a little extra Sacred Realms in your life, you can head over to patreon.com slash sacredrealmspod and become a patron. If you've got no rupees, it is not a problem. Five-star Apple Podcast reviews are a great free way to support us. More reviews means that more people see our show. That makes us very happy. Hi, Leans. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Sacred Realms Pod for updates on the podcast and for behind-the-scenes action. Sacred Realms will be back next Wednesday 
with our rank and recap episode covering our final thoughts on Phantom Hourglass. We'd love for you to play along with us and to share your thoughts on our social channels. If you have not finished Phantom Hourglass yet, it is available to play on the Nintendo DS, 2DS, or 3DS. The cartridge will work on any one of those systems. But in the meantime, may your hearts be full, may your arrows never miss. We'll catch y'all next week. Sacred Realms is an independent, listener-supported podcast, which is produced, edited, and mixed by me, Lyndon Willoughby. Business operations are handled by Matt Willoughby. Our music is generously provided by Darknuck and is available to listen to on Spotify. Finally, we'd like to thank Nintendo for continuing to create such exceptional and innovative experiences.